Good morning. Welcome to the joint committee hearings. Will council members and council staff please turn on their videos at this time? Please place all cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chair, we're ready when you are. I am unmuted. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Cohen, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you to all who have joined us for this remote hearing this morning. We appreciate your time. Um, today's hearing is focused on ensuring that New Yorkers will have adequate access to cooling this summer. With New Yorkers already struggling to navigate the COVID-19 crisis, they should not also have to worry about being able to keep their families cool. Experts predict that this summer will be unusually hot and humid. With more New Yorkers working from home, it is essential that the power stays on. Prior to the co this COVID-19 crisis, power use typically peaked in Manhattan during weekdays. Instead, as the majority of us work from home, the outer boroughs will likely see an uptick in demand due to air conditioner use. Coupled with the hot weather conditions, this means air conditioners will be used more frequently and for longer periods of time, potentially causing a demand on the grid in the outer boroughs that we may not have seen before. This is particularly of concern in light of the blackouts of last summer, which are still fresh in our minds. Every borough was affected by power outages in the summer of 2019. Last July, Midtown Manhattan was sent dark one Saturday evening, forcing restaurants and Broadway shows to close and sending the subway system into chaos. A few days later, during a heat wave, parts of Brooklyn had their power intentionally cut by Con Ed leaving many without air conditioners during the hottest weekend of the year. That was not acceptable. In response, the city council held an oversight hearing last fall and Con Ed appeared before this committee to answer questions about the blackouts. Unfortunately, their answers left many of us uneasy that the company was, uh, taking, the was taking the necessary steps to address ongoing outages. outages. Con Ed doesn't seem to be investing in the needed upgrades and redesign of its aging infrastructure. It chafes at conducting more frequent preventative testing of its equipment or investing in sufficient thermal monitoring devices that could prevent equipment and underground cables from overheating. The $1.5 billion that Con Ed claimed to have spent on system upgrades last year was what experts testified simply routine system maintenance that all utilities must do. Despite that, it has paid out dividends to stockholders almost every year for the last 45 years and continues to raise rates for New Yorkers. In fact, New Yorkers pay some of the highest prices for their electricity, 43% more than the national average to be exact. Today, we are joined by representatives from Con Ed and I thank them for being here to shed light, no pun intended, on our concerns. I'd like to hear from them on exactly what steps Con Ed is taking to ensure that the power stays on, especially for vulnerable New Yorkers, many of whom reside in the areas affected by last year's outages. Many of these neighborhoods are the same ones that are being hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to hear about what Con Ed plans to do about customers who have lost their jobs and are unable to pay their power bills. While we appreciate that Con Ed has currently had a moratorium on power shutoffs for non-payment, it is unclear what the company's plans are once that's lifted. We'll also be hearing from the administration, and I'd like to thank the Commissioner of the Office of Emergency Management, Deanne Criswell, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, Janie Babashi, and Assistant Commissioner Carolyn Olson from DOHMH for joining us. I look forward to hearing from all of you about how the city plans to address the cooling needs of residents while navigating the COVID-19 crisis and the need for social distancing measures. According to recent data, over 80% of heat-related deaths in New York City have occurred in homes without air conditioning. Access to sufficient cooling, therefore, is needed to be addressed and managed as the vital health issue that it is. This is especially true now as many of those most vulnerable to COVID-19 
namely the elderly and those with underlying health conditions are likewise prone to heat related illness and deaths. Public health ex experts are warning that COVID-19 could therefore make heat waves much deadlier and disproportionately affect these vulnerable groups, as well as low income residents who are less likely to have or use air conditioning units. In normal times, every summer, the city typically offers cooling centers throughout various neighborhoods. New Yorkers would normally have access to pools and beaches. This summer will be different. The mayor has announced that pools and beaches will be closed. And at the moment, there is no clear plan on how we will have access to cooling centers while maintaining social distancing. I also look forward to the administration's feedback on two pieces of legislation we are hearing today. First, we have Chair Brennan's bill that seeks to codify reporting on heat vulnerability and heat related deaths. As we know, the, there are concerns that in the past, these figures have been artificially low due to various definitions of what constitutes a hot day. I will be turning it over to him shortly to speak more on this bill. Second, this bill, the emergency management and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop a comprehensive cooling plan for the summer by June 30th, 2020. Before I turn it over to Chair Brennan, I'd like to thank all of the City Council staff who helped make this virtual hearing possible. There are a lot of people in the background helping to run these hearings. I would especially like to thank uh, committee staff, Baltiz Murig, Council to the Committee, and Leah Suprek, uh, Policy Analyst, as well as my staff, uh, Ledge Director, Patty and Trader, and my Chief of Staff, Ariana Collado, for their hard work in making uh, this possible. Uh, also, before I turn it over, I would also like to acknowledge, acknowledge that I think today is uh, the birthday of Council Member Chin. Uh, so happy birthday. And lastly, I'm going to say that we have been joined by, let's see if I can do that. Uh, we have Council Members Chin, Diaz, Lewis, Menchaca, Powers, Rose, Salamanca, Amprey Samuels, Holden, Ku, Lander, and Jaeger. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Justin Brennan. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, good morning. Today I join Chairs Cohen, Levine, and Constantinidis in welcoming you to this joint oversight hearing to discuss Con Edison's summer preparations and the city's cooling needs. My name is Justin Brennan. And I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. And I'd like to extend my thanks to my co-chairs, uh, for holding this hearing and everyone behind the scenes making this happen. As Chair Cohen said, this summer will be unprecedented. We're about to enter another long, hot, humid summer, and we're in the midst of a global pandemic that is forcing us to stay in our homes. We must take immediate action to ensure everyone has access to a safe home this summer, one that shields all residents from both COVID-19 and extreme summer heat in New York City. Because of climate change, temperatures have been rising more rapidly over the past century. And New York City is expected to experience more frequent and longer lasting heat waves. The New York City Panel on Climate Change predicts that for the 2020s, the decade we are now in, the city will experience two to four heat waves per year with each one lasting four to six days. By 2050, the frequency of heat waves is expected to triple. Because of the urban heat island effect, which makes urban areas much hotter than surrounding non-urban areas, average city temperatures can be significantly hotter, more than five degrees hotter during the day and 22 degrees hotter at night. New Yorkers depend on a reliable source of electricity. With people now working from home during the COVID pandemic, the demand for air conditioning over the summer will only increase, especially in the outer boroughs. When the electrical system fails, this puts everyone in the city at significant risk for heat-related illnesses, including dehydration, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Last summer, the city experienced a number of serious power outages as a result of intense rain and sweltering heat. As more residents relied on their air conditioners, pressure on the grid increased, resulting in a loss of power. My district with a lot of overhead power lines experiences at least one power outage every summer. But unlike last summer when the west side of Manhattan blackout made national news, no one ever hears about the outer boroughs losing power every single summer. 
How will these lines handle the increased pressure on the grid when so many residents are at home or working from home running their air conditioners? How is Con Ed prepared for the additional stress on the grid this summer, particularly in the outer boroughs? Last week, Con Ed stated that New Yorkers will pay higher electric bills this summer, with typical monthly bills increasing 10% from last year to about $110 per month from June till September. By the end of June, one in five city workers will likely be unemployed. That's a 22% unemployment rate this quarter, numbers not seen since the Great Depression. How will New Yorkers be able to afford this rate increase? Con Ed has stated that it will not turn off customers' power for not paying bills or charge late fees during the pandemic, but what happens when the pandemic ends and all these bills come due? People who can't afford the, the higher bills now will not magically be able to afford them a few months from now. Public health experts warn that the COVID-19 pandemic could make heat waves much deadlier and disproportionately affect the elderly and residents of lower income, those less likely to have air conditioning units, or if they have an air conditioner, less likely to use it because they can't afford their electric bill to keep it running. Pools are closed. Beaches are not open for swimming. Traditional sites for cooling, traditional sites for cooling centers like senior centers and libraries are closed. The administration is looking at possibly using schools as cooling centers, and I commend them on thinking about alternative sites now. But not all schools have air conditioning, and it's unclear how proper social distancing will be maintained in these cooling centers. I also want to commend the administration on stating it will spend $55 million to purchase air conditioners for low-income seniors and help subsidize some of their utility bills. We must, however, make sure that everyone who needs access to cooling gets it. We also need to know if the grid can handle this additional stress. Today, we will hear my bill, a pre-considered introduction, which would require the Department of Health to annually report on neighborhood heat vulnerability and the number of heat-related deaths. Department of Health reports on heat-related deaths, but its metric is under-inclusive and leaves out many people whose deaths were caused by conditions exacerbated by heat exposure. My bill would require the Department of Health to report not just on the number of heat-related deaths, but also on the social vulnerability and environmental factors that may contribute to those deaths. Deaths caused by heat, just like deaths caused by COVID, disproportionately affect minority and low-income communities. From 2000 until 2012, almost half of the heat-related deaths in New York City were among African Americans. But not enough is being done to address this. My bill would enable the city to allocate necessary resources like cooling devices to the most impacted and underserved areas. I look forward to hearing from the administration about how they will distribute air conditioner units, how schools may be used as cooling centers, and what other steps the city is taking to ensure that all New Yorkers, especially our most vulnerable, will be able to stay cool, safe, and healthy this summer. I also look forward to hearing from Con Ed about what they are doing to ensure the city is prepared this summer and the grid will be able to handle the additional demand as well as the additional demand put forward by the city's plan to distribute air conditioners to low-income communities. Before we begin, I wanna thank my committee staff, committee counsel, Jessica Steinberg-Albin, senior policy analyst, Patrick Mulvihill, senior financial analyst, John Seltzer, and my senior advisor, Jonathan Yedden, and all the council staff from Consumer Affairs, Health, Environmental Protection Committees for their super, super hard work in putting this together. I'll now turn it back to Chair Cohen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Brennan. I think I'm turning it directly over to Chair Levine for an opening. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Kozlowitz uh, and Barron. Chair Levine. Thank you, Chair Cohen and Chair Brannan, and of course, Chair Constantinidis. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and I want to thank all of you for joining us on this remote hearing. The COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on long-standing inequities in our city, including racial, health, and economic disparities. Low-income communities of color, as well as older and medically vulnerable New Yorkers, have all been hit disproportionately hard by this pandemic. And if we don't take action, these inequalities could be exacerbated by the long, hot New York City hot summer ahead. As my colleagues have mentioned, the New Yorkers most impacted by heat-related illnesses and deaths 
overlap with those impacted by COVID-19. And the communities most medically vulnerable to COVID-19 and heat related illnesses are also those communities who are struggling financially because of the effects of the pandemic. We need a multi-strong strategy in place now before the worst of the heat arrives to tackle these challenges. First, if we want New Yorkers, especially those who are vulnerable, to continue to social distance by staying at home as much as possible, and we definitely do want this, then we need to address the fact that as many as half of low-income families have no air conditioning in their apartments. To that end, it's good news that Mayor de Blasio announced that the city is creating a $55 million program to provide 74,000 air conditioners to older New Yorkers without such units. And approximately 22,000 of these air conditioning units will be distributed to NYCHA residents. New Yorkers with no air conditioning at home who are 60 years of age and older and have income below 60% of the state medium, medium income will be eligible for these AC units. But we need to understand what portion of the total need for ACs does this cover? And if it's not sufficient, how can we do even more? Furthermore, we want to ensure that no one goes without cooling because they cannot afford their electricity bills. So I look forward to learning more about Con Ed's plans to ensure that we are protecting and supporting vulnerable communities, especially those who experience blackouts during the summer of 2019. Some of which, like the neighborhood of Flatbush, have also now seen high rates of COVID cases and deaths. On May 15th, the administration announced that it was petitioning the Public Service Commission for 72 million to help pay the utility bills of 450,000 vulnerable New Yorkers so they can afford to run their ACs and keep cool. I'm looking forward to getting an update on this today. Will this funding be enough? Will it cover all those who are vulnerable? These are questions we need to discuss today. Finally, I'm looking forward to an update from the administration on access to cooling centers. As my colleagues have mentioned, we need to find safe ways for New Yorkers to get out of their homes to cool off during the hot weather. This will require likely use of alternative cooling center locations, those that allow for more space for social distancing. And as we stand up new, new cooling centers, let's be mindful of concerns that HVAC, HVAC systems may in fact facilitate coronavirus transmission. I look forward to our discussion today and to ensuring that the hot summer ahead does not further exacerbate the horrible inequality of this pandemic. I wanna thank the amazing health committee staff who have worked so hard on this and so many other issues during these difficult months, including Zay Emanuel Hailu, Sarah Liss and Emily Balkan and my own staff, Amy Slattery and Winthrop Roosevelt. Thank you again. And now I'm gonna turn it back to you, Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I am going to turn it over to uh, Council Member Salamanca, who also has a, a statement regarding his legislation. All right. Uh, good morning. Can, can you hear me, Chair Cohen? Yes. All right. Good morning. I am Council Member Rafael Salamanca from the 17th Council District in the South Bronx. I would like to thank Chair um, Levin, uh, Cohen, Constantinides, and Brandon for allowing me to speak on my bill. Uh, pre-considered 6198. As we approach the third month of stay-at-home orders, New Yorkers are continuing to show their resilient nature in the face of this terrible virus. Following the directives of local and state government, a large majority of our constituents have taken the necessary precautions to ensure the well-being of their loved ones and themselves. As much as we continue to follow social distancing measures, the reality is that there remains much uncertainty about the future about what the future holds. Complicating this uncertain, uncertainty is the typical seasonal issues we face on a yearly basis. With the calendar shifting towards June, New Yorkers are already bracing themselves for the sweltering dog days of summer. While many turn to their home air conditioning units to beat the heat, the truth is countless New Yorkers, including many in my district, do not have the same luxury. For many of my constituents, escaping the peak daytime heat is made easier by a being at their place of employment, a senior center, 
or even a cooling center. With COVID response efforts eliminating almost all gatherings of any sort, there would be far fewer options to stay cool this summer. And with temperatures rising each year, it is more imperative than ever to ensure New York City has a wide range plan to keep New Yorkers safe from the extreme heat. This is why I am introducing pre-considered 6198, which would require the Office of Emergency Management, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and other relevant agencies to create a comprehensive plan due at the end of June. And by the 1st of March of subsequent years on how the city will respond to heat related emergencies during the COVID era and beyond. As part of the plan, OEM and DOHMH will detail how it will inform New Yorkers on the dangers of heat exposure, how to stay cool during the heat related emergencies and how to access cooling options. The plan will also take in depth focus on how to aid the most vulnerable population who face a greater health risk than the general population during heat emergencies. Furthermore, recognizing the stress placed on our electrical grid during a typical summer season that has resulted in widespread blackouts, the plan will also include measures on how large office buildings can reduce their energy consumption during such heat emergencies. While I strongly support the actions of Mayor de Blasio to provide air conditioners and financial relief to vulnerable New Yorkers to protect themselves from the heat, I believe there needs to be a thorough plan in place now and in the future to ensure all New Yorkers, regardless of their income, have the resources to stay safe during a heat emergency. Chairs, thank you for holding this important hearing and allowing me to speak on my bill. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. I think we've also been joined by Council Member Ulrich. Uh, I am going to turn it over to committee council uh, to swear in our first panel. Uh, I wanna let Con Ed know that uh, we've given them uh, 15 minutes on the clock. Uh, we'd appreciate it if they could be as concise uh, as possible. Uh, the members are gonna ask a lot of questions. So anything you don't get in in your opening, you'll, I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to tell us. Uh, so if you could be as brief as possible, we appreciate that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our committee council. Thank you. I am Jessica Steinberg Albin, Counsel to the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee of the New York City Council. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. We will now call on representatives of Con Ed to testify. Matthew Sniffen, Vice President of Con Ed. Kyle Kimball, Vice President of Government, Regional and Community Affairs for Con Ed. And Patrick McHugh, Vice President, Engineering and Planning will be testifying on behalf of Con Ed. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Mr. Sniffen. Yes, I do. Mr. Kimball. Yes, I do. Mr. McHugh. I do. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen, followed by Chair Brannan, and Chair Levine. Mr. Sniffen, Mr. Kimball, and Mr. McHugh, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Cohen, please begin. I think we're actually, turn, we're allowing them to make an opening statement, I believe. Great, I'll go ahead. Oh. Is that all right? It's fine, yes. Okay. That's fine. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle Kimball. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations at Con Edison. And I'm here with my colleagues, Patrick McHugh, uh, Vice President of Distribution Engineering and Planning, and Matt Sniffen, Vice President for Emergency Management. Thank you for taking the time across these four committees to hear about uh, our summer 
2020 preparations uh, at this critically important time. We plan to give you a very high level overview of our preparations for this summer. And you have graciously granted us no more than 15 minutes to get through this, so we will move along quickly. And we'll happily provide you more detail during the Q&A. Um, as we enter the summer of 2020, all of us are faced with a summer unlike anything we've ever experienced personally and professionally. And keeping our customers safe, as well as our employees, has been and remains our top priority. In addition to our safe, normal safety concerns, we recognize that this summer, as it heats up, that the reliable delivery of energy is an important component of our collective public health efforts. So we will spend the next few minutes discussing with you how we will have, what we have undertaken to prepare for this summer, to give you a sense of the lessons we've learned from last summer, how those learnings have been shaped by the current pandemic, and the investments we've made to ensure that we remain one of the most reliable energy providers in the world. First, while our forecasters do see overall lower demand for electricity this summer, the demand will most certainly shift away from the traditional commercial centers to residential areas as uh, several speakers have noted. Second, we have made significant investments into the energy grid based on our learnings and analysis from last summer to one, minimize the chances of outages, minimize the number of people affected by an outage, minimize the amount of time people are without power in the case of an outage, and retooling our communication plans to ensure that our appeals for to use less energy and information during an outage are more effectively more effectively reach our customers and stakeholders. We have particularly focused on investments in the Flatbush network, investments to improve the capacity to deliver electricity to over two dozen NYCHA developments that were at their capacity limits. And this is particularly important to supporting the heat, the city's heat mitigation plan and its current proposal to provide bill credits to customers enrolled in our low, low and moderate income programs. Third, we are in very close weekly communication with the mayor's office and emergency management preparing for this summer, enhancing communication protocols and giving them detailed analysis of our electric load forecasts and summer preparations. Fourth, we will continue to work with our customers through the summer to address issues of financial hardship. Since March 13th, we have proactively suspended the termination of service uh, for non-payment we are waiving late fees and providing flexible payment agreements for those that need help. But before I turn it over to Patrick, who will walk through uh, our summer preparations overview in more detail, it's worth noting that climate change and the more intense storms and heat events coupled with a pandemic, it is imperative that our adaptation as a city includes both investment in smart technologies, but also investments in efficiency and alternatives to traditional approaches to enhance our resiliency. So with that, I will turn it over to Patrick McHugh, who can walk through more detailed uh, about our preparations. And also, we did send along a presentation. I know that we're not presenting it on the screen, but hopefully uh, the council staff and uh, council members have that presentation. Go ahead, Patrick. OK, just checking that people can hear me. Yep. OK. So if you have the presentation, I'm on slide four. As we prepare for summer 2020, we've been putting considerable effort into developing a very detailed forecast of the peak usage for the upcoming summer. Each year we work to design and upgrade the system to be ready for the forecasted peak energy usage. Pre-COVID, the summer peak forecast was estimated to decrease by a few megawatts from last year. However, the overall impact of COVID has reduced the overall energy consumption in the city. Based on the current trends, we see an overall weekday reduction of approximately 16% and a weekend reduction of 8.5%. Our current system peak forecast for the summer is now 12,000 megawatts, down from 13,270 megawatts last year, a 10% reduction. All boroughs have seen a redu reduction in usage when compared to similar times and temperatures last year to this year. Some areas have seen more significant than, than others. We are, as mentioned earlier, we are seeing the possibility of a few areas that may increase in load, and we are taking quick action to upgrade equipment in these areas to address these new forecasts that are coming out. We will continue to monitor the energy consumption behavior around the city. And minutes left. Summer. And we will adjust our plans as necessary based on any new observations. Just checking that I'm still being heard? Yeah. Okay. 
So, that, so for those with the presentation, go to the next slide, slide five. Last fall, we developed our summer prep plan to get ready for the summer, for summer 2020. I am happy to report that we are going to meet and exceed that plan, even with the impact that COVID has had on our operations. Throughout the entire impact of that pandemic, the brave women and men of Con Edison operations and field forces have worked side by side with many of the other essential employees in the city to keep the essential services of the city going. This effort has enabled us to complete all our summer prep work that was planned last fall to have the system in a strong position going into the summer. We have invested $1.3 billion in the power system. This work was to improve the safety and reliability of the system, prepare the system for more distributed resources and connect new customers to the grid. As Kyle mentioned, this investment included multiple upgrades in the Flatbush region of the grid where we had the unfortunate outage event in the overhead area of the grid last summer. We have upgraded cables in both the 27 and 4 kV systems in this area installed six new sw switches in the overhead and underground to provide better reliabilities of the feeders. We have also completed relay upgrades on all feeders supplying the overhead grid in this area and developed a new control system to allow operators to surgically sectionalize the overhead grid if problems develop. In other areas around the city, we've worked with NYCHA to address 29 NYCHA locations around the system to allow for additional energy consumption for people sheltering in place in these areas. We have also completed significant reliability upgrades across all five boroughs. To be ready for summer 2020, we have upgraded distribution feeders and transformers that were nearing their capacity. 31 locations have been addressed. I also wanna highlight that we continue to deploy grid edge technology to continue to make the grid safer, smarter, more reliable, and more easily accessible to distributed resources. This technology includes smart meters, which allows two-way communications to the meter and real near-time data usage information, two-way communication to underground switches to make the network system more adaptable to two-way power flows and quickly respond to system issues, and third, manhole sensors that detect abnormal condition in manholes and communicate that information back to the work center. I wanna note that we did temporarily support the smart meter um, deployment during the COVID impact. Um, we do plan to restart the redeployment in the weeks ahead on a phased approach. The new meters greatly enhance social distancing by no longer requiring meter readers to go into customer premises to get meter readings and also allow turn-ons and turn-off requests to be done remotely. Finally, to address some of the unknowns about the redistribution of customer energy usage patterns around the city from the COVID impact, we have secured an additional 12 large two megawatt generators to add to our fleet. We plan to preemptively locate these units in residential areas to help address any new loading concerns that arise. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matthew Sniffen. Thanks, Patrick. I'll be on slide six. So good morning. My name is Matt Sniffen. I'm Vice President of Emergency Preparedness at Con Edison. Based on lessons learned from our experience last year, we updated our emergency response plans. To measure their effectiveness, we do numerous drills each year, many in collaboration with New York City Emergency Management. After last summer's incidents, we met with New York City Emergency Management and the Mayor's Office of Resilience. The output was a request for a series of workshops aimed at each side getting a better understanding of our system and the city agency's needs. This year, we have jointly established a communication protocol during heat waves that will keep the agencies informed as an event is potentially unfolding. We will continue to communicate with NISOM as an activation happens, including embedded team members in each other's emergency operations centers. As temperatures rise, we activate our plans, adjust our schedules for better coverage. Slide seven. As we get into contingency and heat events, we have several options that we preemptively use in order to avoid load shedding event like Flatbush last year. When we are having a network problem, we typically do a network focused appeal as the area contingency does not influence other areas. That's all I have. Uh, Great. So, of, yeah, so we can go ahead and go ahead and go ahead into uh, questions because I know you have a lot of questions. I really, I appreciate uh, you being as uh, succinct as that. Uh, before we get into questions, I'm going to turn it back uh, to the committee council, who will just uh, outline how the Q and A will work. Thank you, Chair Cohen. 
During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of Con Ed, the administration, or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen, followed by Chair Brannon and Chair Levine. Mr. Sniffen, Mr. Kimball, and Mr. McHugh, if you could please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. Um, thank you. Chair Cohen, please begin. Uh, time starts now. Thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, I appreciate your testimony. Um, uh, I am concerned a little bit about uh, the change in, in the pattern of usage um, uh, as, as people are working more from home, uh, it is entirely possible uh, that the central business district will be significantly below its normal usage. Uh, do you feel like you have the flexibility uh, and you've done some modeling, it sounds like, uh, but I mean, there's no data, there's no you know track record to, well, it was like this uh, two years ago, like how are you uh, projecting usage? So I would agree with your statement. This has never been done, you know, so we, we're actually running four models. We've developed four different models to try to predict the energy consumption that will be done in any specific area of the city. We are then on a conservative basis using the highest forecast from those four models. I won't go into all the different aspects of those four models, but they attempt to forecast the load in different ways. Um, but I would give you, as, as we look at it, uh, going into it, it is a typical weekend. If you have a Saturday or Sunday, most people are home and doing that. So we would think that a lot of areas are going to look a lot like a Saturday or Sunday uh, from a normal summer, you know, that that's where we start as a basis. Um, and you see those areas of Manhattan goes down, you know, 30% uh, on a weekend and you have the weekend areas in the outer boroughs are still below on an average summer. They're still below their peak weekday usage. They may be at 98% or 97% of their weekday usage on the weekend. So it gives us some confidence that everybody being at home, we've seen those type of things. We do have concern with the staycation effect. Something we call the staycation effect is that usually in the summer period, there's a certain percentage of the people who leave the city who may have gone on vacation and those people would be residing in the area. So you have that as a plus and add to the load. Uh, on the negative side, you have people who aren't coming to the city, the tourists and other people visiting as well as hotels and other commercial establishments down. So somewhere there's some pluses and minuses. We have identified some areas that we've seen that we're forecasting an increased load. Those are residential areas. We have moved, we've designed over a dozen jobs to upgrade feeders in those areas. Um, and we continue to monitor it. We, we, every day we do, we take a sampling of the energy pattern and we monitor it and compare it to last year and try to identify differences uh, and we will continue to do that every week as we go further and further into the summer. I guess, uh, you know, we saw the New York Times report about, uh, you know, a lot of wealthier New Yorkers uh, leaving the city. Uh, so I'm particularly, uh, you know, even if you have the, the, the overall power usage, you don't expect to be unusual, the distribution is going to be different. Uh, and so, I, you know, we're all very, very concerned about, you know, communities that are already, that are going to have the highest concentrations of people that have already been, you know, really hard hit uh, with COVID, uh, they we're going to be able to maintain power to those communities uh, during the peak summer season. So, so I, we should, I'm sorry. I just want to, uh, so, I mean, you think that the system has the flexibility to deliver the power 
where it's needed. So we share your concern and we've been on this for weeks now, you know, getting, getting, uh, reviewing this and getting ready for this uh, as we go into the summer. So we believe that we've, we've identified areas where we've run increased usage and seen if there's any kind of overloads and we've quickly moved to address those. So we, we feel comfortable, uh, comfortable in that. The other thing we did is say, we're not gonna know everything. We, we are not gonna be able to predict this. This is a model of a, some, something that has not been done. And that's why we quickly moved to secure those 12 two megawatt generators, uh, two megawatt pretty substantial energy usage in a network. And we felt that those would give us flexibility to give us time to monitor what's happening on the system as we go into June. Later in June, we'll probably get a better uh, handle on where the load is appearing. Uh, and we can deploy those generators. So we have 12 additional, we have a fleet of 20. Uh, we've added 12, um, 12 we look to preemptively put out there, ready to support on a heat wave, and we'll continue to evaluate what, what else we may do as the summer progresses. Did you test, testify, uh, if I, did, you missed, I may have missed it, what is the maximum, uh, the, the peak, typical peak usage? The, city. the typical peak usage for the system is is this year we're forecasting 12,000 megawatts. A typical summer is about 13,250. So we're down uh, about 10% from a typical summer uh, peak forecast system wide. But again, we're concerned. Like everybody's. Can, can I ask? Why do you predict? Uh, to, to be down? What, what factors uh, what produces that? So a lot of the significant office buildings, the, you know, you got Barclays Center, Madison Square Garden, Broadway, um, other type of facilities, malls, strip malls, th those type of, th those businesses, businesses consumption compared to residential consumption, business consumption is typically much higher than typical residential con uh, consumption, especially on the hotter days. So that, that's what's helping to drive that, but no way in shape or form does that not say in residential areas, we're concerned. I think there's concern both in the residential building. If you add additional capacity and demand in the building, you may have internal problems as well as in the street in that local area providing power will local problems develop. And that's uh, an area we're, we're trying to stay focused on. Uh, I'd like to know, how do you decide uh, to, if you quote unquote have to shed, how do you decide where you're gonna do that? So in an event like last year in Brooklyn, we had a grid that was uh, an over, a 4KV overhead grid in that area that was supplied with 15 supply feeders. Um, we designed it to lose any two two and then when we lose two feeders the load then picks up on the remaining 13 so if you have 15 you lost two 13 are now carrying those that load and it's designed to do that in the event last year which is a good example we we went up to a sixth feeder contingency um had six of the 15 feeders out of service uh, with a uh, another station having some problems as well so basically seven so seven of the 15 feeders feeding that area were out of service for meaning the remaining load, remaining energy was being carried on those eight. Those eight were now overloaded. And if we didn't take quick action, the, the most probable engineering analysis was that all eight would have failed. They would have cas continued to cascade. In that event, they cascaded. The first, between the first and the second feeder outage was, was many, many hours. From the second to the third, you were talking maybe an hour. The third to the fourth, maybe 45 minutes. The fifth, you know, so you get to a cascading condition. One of the, the, the designs of our system is unlike any really around, around the United States. When you lose a feeder, customers don't lose power in the, in the grid network that we have. The other feeders pick up. So it's a very reliable, it makes us the most reliable in the United States. But what you do get into is cascading conditions. If you lose a couple of feeders, you have not lost a customers and therefore the remaining feeders are overloading and you're impacting a larger area of the grid. And the operators are trained to make a decision. Is it, is it gonna cascade 
to take out all the equipment. And in that case, if last summer we would have waited, we would have had to fix all 15 feeders before we could restore people, as opposed to we just had to fix six. Uh, because when we shut them down, we had eight good feeders. We were able to start picking people up uh, rather quickly and had about half the people picked up, half the customers restored by, I believe it was midnight that night. I hope that yeah, answers your question, council member, that, that you, 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 first of all, load shedding is a, a last resort. Um, and, but to answer your question more, more directly, uh, I think that was a good answer specifically, but you shed where the problem is to avoid a longer, you don't just pick an area of town and say, hey, we need some power from here because these other people need it over here. It's that there's a problem here. We need to shed here so that we don't have a longer outage here. That was exactly, I was gonna follow up because that was exactly what I wanted to know. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, uh, just uh, uh, briefly talking about, uh, you know, post COVID, uh, if there's such a thing as post COVID, uh, in terms of customer shutoffs, uh, how many customers a year do you shut off for non-payment? Uh, it's a couple of hundred, I believe. Just a couple of hundred. I can, we can get back to you with a specific number. Uh, I saw something floating around, but I, th I think it's a couple hundred a year. Yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely sure. But we're not really shutting anyone off now, as you, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, I understand that, but I, I think as one of my, I think as Chair Brennan made at some point, you know, we're gonna go back to, to business here. And uh, I'd like to know uh, in terms, you know, what your plans are to deal with customers who are uh, behind in their electric bill. So, so we're doing a couple of things, and there I would say there's not necessarily post COVID, but summer and post summer. Uh, during the summer, we are not going to do shutoffs. We are not doing. Uh, we're waiving all fees. Um, people who want to go on payment plans, uh, we're being very flexible with that, um, and that's really getting us through the summer, the summer months. Um, in addition, we're um, supportive of the city's petition in front of the mayor's office's petition in front of the uh, public service commission currently to provide bill credits for the summer uh, to folks who are enrolled in our low and moderate income programs. Um, so we're doing a number of things to sort of ease the financial burden um, so that one, people feel like they have access to uh, their air conditioners uh, this summer and, and are not necessarily making those economic choices. Um, but then also working with folks who, who can pay their bill, but they just need a different arrangement to pay it or that kind of thing. So we're being very flexible there. And I think then there's the post summer era uh, and that's something we'll, I can't tell you what the, the plan is there other than everything we're doing now is gonna continue through the summer months. And then we'll work closely with the city and the public service commission to figure out what to do um, uh, to, uh, with customers who are facing financial hardship in the fall. The other piece is there's a federal program um, called LIHEAP, Low Income Heating Assistance, uh, Heating Electric Assistance Program, I believe. Uh, it's money that comes from the federal government distributed through the state uh, to our low income customers through the city. So there's a number of different programs uh, in place to help ease the financial burden. Uh, I appreciate that, thank you. Um... Uh, I'm curious also about the the rate increase. Can you tell us how much of Con Ed's electricity is, what energy is used to produce it, whether it's oil, natural gas, I guess we some percentage of renewables? Sorry, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear, I cut out a little bit. What was the question? Uh, how our electricity is produced, What uh, whether through oil, natural gas, coal, and I don't think we use coal, but... What are the, 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 the fuels used in, and renewables, the percentage, uh, how we get our, how our electricity is manufactured? Uh, the, 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 I don't know the exact percentages, but, and maybe Suzanne DeRoche, who is going to testify, or, or, or JV, the city who's going to testify later can talk about their, their planning mix. Um, but essentially, the vast majority of the electricity in the city is produced through natural gas or nuclear. Uh, those are the two largest. And then a much smaller percentage through renewables, but hopefully more uh, as time passes and those renewable assets get installed like the offshore wind farm uh, off the coast of Long Island and, and, that, and that sort of things. Um, I would say zero to 
very little is through coal. And if it, if it is through coal, it's not power that's produced in New York State. Uh, it's power that's produced elsewhere, maybe power coming in through Pennsylvania or points west through the PJM network. Um, but that's the vast majority of elect the, how, it's, how it's broken down. Nuclear, natural gas are the vast majority of it, and then some components of renewables. And oh, I, I, would, I would add the hydros as well. I'm sorry, hydro as well. Yes, yes, thank you. And I was, it, it, okay. Good, please. I would just, you know, just remind that we don't own the, the power plants, right? We buy, we get the power from the New York ISO, just to make sure everybody's on uh, the same playing field on that. I, I guess so that if the, with, with natural gas prices so low, I'm curious to why the cost of electricity is, is rising so significantly. So if you look at, um, and I can, we can provide this information to the council later. So if you, if you look at a historical look at the bill, the average residential customers who uses around 300 kilowatt hours, uh, they have, the bills really haven't changed much since 2010. So that's for the average residential customer. Uh, but within that bill, there's three different components of the bill. There is the supply cost, which you're referencing. Um, so that's just a pure pass-through. We buy the electricity on your behalf through the NISO and, um, then you're charged that amount. And that's just, we're just passing through the cost. Have those costs gone down as natural and gas? Those costs have gone down because of the price of natural gas. Uh, delivery costs, which is the amount of money that Con Edison uses to invest in the system or to pay fixed costs um, has gone up. So that's when, when you see rate, rate increases or when we go, go for rate cake cases, that's us asking for specific investments to make in the system, like the like the investments we made this summer, those are from rate cases in the past, um, and that has gone up. Uh, and then the third component of the bill of the third of the three is taxes, uh, and that's uh, us. That's we pay about one point nine billion dollars a year in taxes um, to the city, and so it's basically a third, a third, a third. Right now, the biggest component in twenty nineteen, the biggest component of someone's bill is actually taxes. And then the second component of the bill um, is, is the delivery charge. And the third, in the distant third is the uh, supply costs. And so that's essentially what's happened is a lot of the costs, there's either delivery costs because we have to invest more in the system um, or taxes are being raised. In this most recent rate case, uh, where we asked for 810 million, it's a three-year case, we asked for 810 million uh, on the electric side, half of the rate case increase we asked for was just to pay taxes um, to the city. So about 400 million was going to the city for taxes. Uh, the other 400 million is left over between uh, investments we want to make in the system or the other component that we have to pay within our delivery costs are called uh, what's called public interference. So whenever the city wants to move a water main or build a uh, East, like for example, East Coast Resiliency, the, the wall around Lower Manhattan. If we have to move, you know, a gas line, a steam line, an electric line, a feeder, um, we would normally not have moved it, but we have to because the city has asked us to. So we do, we have to, it's part of our franchise. And um, so that actually has costs. And so, so of the 400 million that's left after taxes from a rate increase, a big component of that, probably about half of it is public interference, paying for public works projects that the city has asked us to do. And then the rest is left, left over as investment into the system. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Brennan, but there's just two more uh, quick points I'd like to make. Um, I just wanna echo something that he said, you know, in the Northwest Bronx, uh, I have a significant part of my district that is served uh, by overhead wires and uh, it's not always as reliable as we would like. Um, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Eric Soto and Evan, Evelyn Oliver. They are uh, pretty responsive to our office. So I want to say thank you to that. Uh, I am going to turn it over to Chair Brennan, but I'll, I'll come back. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Thank you. Um, um, Kyle, you'll forgive me, but it sounds like a hell of a time 
for a rate increase. Um, we have almost a million New Yorkers are out of work. Um, what are we basing the 10% increase on? So the increase is uh, the things I just mentioned. So we have to make some investments in the system for, for resiliency, reliability, uh, and there's, and Patrick can talk about the, those, ish, those points. So we make investments into the system, uh, but then about half of the rate increase was um, uh, taxes. So of the 810 million that we asked for about 400, I think about close to 400 million is, is just to pay taxes to the city. And then the other piece is to, for public interference costs. Uh, but that means that we have to do a project because the city has asked us to do it. Um, and those can be socialized. And then the rest is investment in the system. Are any of those, the, the, the investments you're making, are these emergency investments or are these investments that you were planning to make anyway? So I wouldn't call them I wouldn't call them emergency investments. Those are investments that a we're either planning for um, you know increasing reliability in an area or adding a new substation. I go to the Bronx East 179th Street. We are building a new substation in East 179th Street. So the large majority is planned work um, that we are doing to get the system uh, ready for the years to come. Right, but so these aren't these aren't investments that. These are investments that would be happening even if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. Those are investments, yes, that were, yeah. yeah. So was there any thought given to, to pausing those investments? I mean, you know, with, with your customers are gonna have to pay for it at a time like this? Uh, I, th we, we have thought about a lot of different ways to ease the financial burden. Um, we find that the, you know, the, the investments that are giving us comfort around this summer and hopefully giving you comfort around this summer are choices that uh, we made a couple of years ago to invest in system. And so that's the way our, the way the rate case process works is we're making investment choices on behalf of our customers to keep it reliable. And so we have to keep that going in the face of, you know, if you looked at our climate change vulnerability study, uh, we have to make investments in the system because we are increasingly vulnerable to uh, the elements. I'm not suggesting that we put, you know, certainly we, we don't have the luxury of putting climate change on hold and putting the climate crisis on hold. I'm just worried about the here and now um, and the idea of a rate increase when, um, you know, I understand you got bills to pay. I don't know that I don't know that the customers would would feel that Kana deserves a rate increase right now. What is the monthly, what is the approximate monthly dollar amount that that residential customers would be expected to pay? The average residential customer, is, the typical bill is around eighty four dollars. So eighty four dollars above what they were. No, no, no. Just that's the all in. That's the typical bill for eighty four dollars. Yeah. So, but right, but how much more is that with the with the rate increase? What would it be? It's a couple of percentage points more. Uh, I think it's maybe $3 more. I can get back to you on the exact numbers. Okay. Um, the, the air conditioner plan um, that the city rolled out, which is something I support, um, um, you know, I'm interested in, in the costs of it, obviously, but also how much discussion did you have with the administration uh, to prepare for, for this plan? Was there a lot of conversations around how uh, this would be implemented, if the grid could handle it, that kind of stuff? Yes, we've had uh, a great coordination. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading Council Member Ku's bill. Um, I can see his bill on his screen. Um, yes, we have worked very closely with uh, the city on their, on their uh, AC program. Uh, ideas, uh, and as well as NYSERDA, uh, as well as the Public Service Commission. Um, and in part of that coordination has been preparing for ex doing exercises with the city to prepare for uh, any, any crisis we might face. Or uh, in the meantime, on its AC program, thinking around where these uh, air conditioners might go and how those impacts, how those might impact the grid. And I think our, the conclusion of that is that we are not particularly concerned with 60 or so thousand air conditioners going around the system, being dispersed across the system. 
what we've been working with the city and trying to work with the city is understanding if there's concentrations. So 60,000 air conditioners is not necessarily a problem for the overall network, but on a block by block basis, if you add a lot of capacity at the last transformer or you know, on a block by block basis, we've been uh, thinking about and looking at what those impacts could be. But yes, we've been in close coordination with them on the program. Um, is it correct that between January, uh, January 1st and April 1st of this year, Con Ed has seen $2 billion in profit? Um, so that's Con Ed, that's CEI. So the utility that we're talking about is, is Con Edison Corporation of New York. Uh, but there's a larger parent company, Con Edison Incorporated, um, that has a number of different investments across the United States. Um, so for example, we're the, I think the world's second largest, or sorry, the second largest renewable developer in North America, for example. So the profits that you're talking about are at the parent company level across the portfolio of assets um, that the company owns. That is not necessarily the profit level at um, the regulated utility. That profit level is regulated by the Public Service Commission. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just having, I'm having trouble squaring a 10% increase at a time like this when the parent company, whatever it is, has, has brought in $2 billion. Um, so, so Kyle, I would just add that that 10% that you may be referring to, the latest uh, has been on the supply costs. So the last information going into the summer, uh, our rate increase was uh, put into effect at the end of last year. Going into this summer, we have had a supply increase cost of, of nearly do a double digit supply increase cost from last year. So I just want to make sure those. And just to be clear, the, there's three different, as I said, there's three components of the bill. There's supply, which is the power itself that we go out and procure on behalf of the customer. And then there's delivery. So the supply cost, that's not a place that Con Edison makes profit. That is the pure cost of the energy that is passed through to the customer. Um, and every summer, the New York ISO independent system operator uh, and the Public Service Commission and the utilities, um, basically there's a formula that's put together to decide uh, what the costs are gonna be for um, the energy over the summer. And so the supply costs that you're talking about, I think council member Brennan are, that is not Con Edison profit. That is going directly to the people who make the energy. We don't make any of the electricity. That is not something that we can control. Um. So what assistance is Con Ed gonna provide for customers who, who can't afford their bills? So we are um, doing, um, we are doing payment plans um, to the extent that folks can. We have, we're, we're waiving the fees and doing all this stuff through summer months. Uh, and we obviously have suspended shutoffs or term service terminations for the ability to non pay. And hopefully uh, in, in conjunction with the city, uh, we will provide be providing you know thirty to forty dollar bill credits to low income customers per month um, to uh, offset the costs of uh, energy during the summer. Now, do you have a moratorium on 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 cutoffs? We on do. Cutoff? And how long? What is that? How long is there? Is there an end date? There is not a specific end date, uh, but we've said through the summer months. So that it, implied in that is you know sometime in September. Okay, um, I certainly hope customers are not gonna experience outages, but if they do, or that will they get a refund? Uh, we do have programs for, you know, food spoilage and, um, uh, you know, any, any, any costs that businesses incur from power outages. Okay, but there's nothing special in place. Nothing special in place for around outages now. All right, you were talking before about renewable energy, um, which, you know, one of the reasons why we're all fans of renewal, renewable energy is because it's cost saving, cost reducing, cost efficient. Um, how does that square with the, with the rate increase? I'm just, there's a lot of sort of cognitive dissonance here I'm trying to figure out. Uh, so the, 
the re renewable energy, so you have to, so it's renewable energy, the idea of it being less expensive or more efficient is obviously after it's installed and it's in place. Um, but isn't it, isn't it cheaper for, for you? We are, we are, no, I mean, not necessarily. It's, it's, we are supportive of, of renewable energy. Um, but it's, it's in terms of the electrons themselves, we are, in terms of moving electrons from point A to point B, we are in, indifferent. So, I mean, as a policy met level, we're not indifferent, but as a matter of electricity, we are indifferent. And as far as the rate increases, I mean, is there is there an equitable approach? I mean, you know, to not, you know, folks that are already struggling to pay their bills. I mean, do we have to do we have to raise the rates on them? Well, I think like if you are a lower moderate income uh, person who's going to receive a you know, thirty to forty dollar bill credit uh, this summer. That is more than offsetting any rate increases um, that you're going to see from. All right. So tell tell me broadly, I guess, in, in as simple layman terms as you can, so even I can understand what is being done differently now to prepare um, for this summer versus summers in the past. And understanding that. Um, you know, the fact that Broadway is dark and Madison Square Garden is, is closed, um, you know, understanding that the power not being used there doesn't help me out in Diker Heights or, you know, out, out in Southeast Queens. Um, so what, what's being done for this moment that we're in right now? Sure. Um, I can, I can start it and then Patrick and, and Matt can, st um, come in, um, I think first, what's different is that we are, uh, I feel like this summer we are much closer coordination with the city and emergency management and preparations in terms of our communication. Uh, I find that the mayor's office is very on top of our planning and the load forecast this summer. Um, I think second, um, we have made very directed investments in the areas, I think, and took the learnings from last summer in a particularly in a Flatbush network um, and made investments to, to improve that system, but also minimize the number of people that would be affected by an outage in that. So by making the circuit smaller. Uh, I think third, uh, and, I, and Patrick can go into more detail on this, is specifically focusing on NYCHA. So in February, we worked with NYCHA, we started with NYCHA and did a study of all their developments. And our concern was that there were not necessarily problems in NYCHA developments with the, the grid, but rather they were at capacity. So to the extent that they needed more capacity, um, to add cooling, for example, uh, we were going to have we we would need upgrades to the, the amount of electricity, the ability to deliver electricity to a NYCHA development. So we studied all of the NYCHA developments and looked at uh, specific places where we could make upgrades to improve NYCHA's capacity to deliver to add uh, electricity load within its developments. Um, so that's a, another big difference. And then and fourth, uh, we have undertaken an effort to completely retool our communications. Uh, and our ability to communicate with electeds and stakeholders um, during an outage. Uh, so hopefully uh, we will be better about that this summer as well. And then of course, fourth, uh, what we're doing for uh, uh, supporting the city and its AC in its AC program as well. Those, those are all feel very different this year. And, and I would add to that, Kyle, right? So we have been, you know, looking and studying this. Usually by, by March, April, we'd have decided what the summer peak is going to be, and we've been uh, kind of done with that. We are involved every week looking at the energy consumption and comparing that and going through it in fine detail with engineers and load forecasters ar around the city. We run into four models. We are taking the worst when we get that output. If it's an increase in load in an area, as I said, over a dozen jobs, we we put out to the field uh, to upgrade cables to address that. Um, we are working with the city as they deploy those uh, air conditioners to try to find hot spots or areas where they are accumulating a lot of them and trying to address that on a, pre, uh, a preemptive basis. So we, we want that information. So we, we a lot of communication around that. And uh, last thing I would say is we, we approached our um, making sure equipment in service and anything that's out of service, we gave it a very strong residential feel this spring to make sure that uh, we were focusing on the residential areas to make sure any equipment out of service that we're, we're giving that a higher priority of getting it back in service as we get ready for the summer. Those are some of the things that are different this year 
Uh, and I would add uh, it's on the, the 12 generators. Well, one of our concerns going into this summer is, you know, with an underground system, we could have spent a lot of effort saying, hey, this area we think is going to increase and let's dig up the street and let's do all this work in a COVID environment where resources are down and people are down, the amount of resource we have to do that work. Or we said, you know what, something mobile, nimble, we could get all, you know, we can get into a hot spot very quickly and support the city. So we quickly mobilized and were able to obtain those 12 large generators uh, in the Northeast of the United States. We got our hands on those very quickly to get them into New York City uh, and ready to go for the summer. So uh, that's another big step that we made. And, and I just, I wanna stress the mobility of that because all these models, any model has error and uh, they give us some flexibility in the error on where any of the load may increase and we can move those accordingly. I just have a few more. Um, I mean, I understand you guys don't have a crystal ball, uh, but based on your experience in the field and what your engineers are telling you, um, is there cause for concern this summer that, 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 it, that this summer is gonna be different from other summers? Is there cause for concern with, you know, more folks staying at home uh, because of COVID that's, that's going to uh, give us an unprecedented summer? Or are you guys confident that, you know, we're going to be okay? So I would lead that uh, just when we get ready for every summer, we are getting ready for, you know, a, a, a peak design. So we don't underestimate any part of this. We do agree that this is going to be different and anything different is gonna need a lot of attention. So it is going to be more difficult for us from an engineering perspective to really be in day in and day out, digging in to understand what is happening, where new pockets are developing. Because year to year things are pretty stable and, and the, the energy consumption, if it is new and large will be new buildings and stuff like that. And we already spend a lot of time you know, doing those studies and being ready for that. So this is going to have us, you know, really make sure we're totally engaged as each week goes by in the summer, not just waiting to that, to that peak day, to that 100 degree day, but we are going to have to be engaged every week as the temperature goes up to really study what's happening and where pockets are. We, 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 we don't, ex, you know, we, we never say there's gonna be nothing, that, that things will happen and we wanna be prepared that if things happen that we, A, are ready and, and quickly respond and communicate well to all of the stakeholders when that happens. The only thing, other thing I would add to that is one thing that will be complicated for us this summer is our ability to respond in the con to a particular outage. You know, our, our our typical model is one of density, right? We get together in a if there's a big emergency, we get together in a in a closed space, and it's called a circ. And that's where we basically focus the entire company on a specific outage or a set of events. Um, and that, so our ability to respond to both events, both in the street and as a corporation uh, are gonna be tested by our you know, social distancing and COVID-19 measures to keep our workers safe in the streets. So that's just something we've never uh, had to deal with, right? So keeping everyone safe in the street, both the customers and our workers as they respond to outages in the context of COVID-19, maintaining social distancing, having the proper PPE, those will all be new things um, that we are gonna be experiencing this summer. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back to the chair, Cohen, but I, I, um, you know, I, I think I speak for a lot of my colleagues in that you guys are typically res you know, fairly responsive and helpful um, when things go wrong. But I, I, I certainly think I speak for my colleagues in the sense that we don't want things to go wrong, right? I mean, power goes out in my district reliably every summer. Um, a lot of it is overhead power lines. Sometimes it's in a storm. Sometimes it's just too hot. I, you know, I can set my watch that power will go out in my district this summer, guaranteed. Uh, in addition to the fact that now we're having more stress on the grid because of people staying home because of COVID. Um, I guess, you know, our concern overall is that, yeah, you guys are responsive and helpful and you'll get out there and help us get the power back up and running. But we'd like to get to a place where th that doesn't have to happen, where we, we can be proactive instead of being reactive. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from, you know, sort of saying, well, you know, power goes out, we'll fix it. 
great. But, you know, what happened in Midtown last summer that made national headlines happens in the outer boroughs every summer. And no one, you know, except maybe the local newspaper talks about it, you know. So this is very much what we're dealing with in, in the outer boroughs. And the responsiveness is great. But we'd like to I'd love to have a summer where I don't have to be called. You know, I don't have to be calling Con Ed freaking out because the power is out in my district. So that's really our concern here. And, um, you know, it sounds like you guys are, are pretty prepared, or at least I, I don't feel that you're worried. I think we're certainly more worried than, than you are. Um, doesn't sound like you're worried. I mean, I'm, I hope you're right. I hope I'm wrong. You know, I don't want to be dealing with this this summer. None of us do with everything else going on. So um, I appreciate that, but, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give it back to Chair Cohen so, so other folks can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Levine. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I wanted to ask a few questions about our plan to distribute air conditioning units to low-income families. Would that be appropriate for you, Commissioner Griswell? Is this being run by OEM? She might be muted. Okay, I don't know if it would be uh, Director Vavishi from Office of Resiliency. I think it's OEM though. I'm sorry, Chair Levine, I missed your question. No problem at all. I wanted to ask about our plan to distribute air conditioning units to low-income families. I wasn't sure if it's uh, your office, uh, Madam Director, or whether it's uh, emergency management. We're both happy to answer direct. that question, but can, should we do that in the next panel after our testimony? Ah, forgive me. Okay, uh, I'm being admonished by Chair Cohen. In the interest of keeping things moving on, then I'm gonna I'm gonna hit pause and I'll come back to you um, at the appropriate time. You know, Mark, you don't have any questions for Con Ed at this point. Uh, no, we'll keep things moving. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. No problem. Uh, All right. So I'm gonna ask the moderator to call on members who have questions. I believe we have several. I also want to mention that we've been joined by Council Member Levin. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Chair Cohen. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, you will be limited to five minutes for your question and its answer in total. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we'll hear from Council Member Koo, followed by Council Member Lander. Council Member Koo. Time starts now. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for all the chairs doing a very good job and the committee staff too. Uh, I have a question for Con Edison. Uh, first, um, you said you don't send off, uh, turn off notice, but I believe many commercial tenants, they have turned off notice uh, sent out by Con Edison. So it doesn't apply to commercial tenants, right? Um, so as people might be getting uh, turn off notices um, for um, so the, so you're asking about specifically about commercial uh, yeah because I have a commercial tenant turn off notice here you know, okay. right in front of me yeah, yeah I can okay. check I, I believe it I, I believe it applies to everyone because uh, a lot of business they hasn't been open for more than two or three months absolutely they, yeah they don't even make one uh, one penny you know. So yeah. how can they have money to pay a uh, condo bill? But meanwhile, they can receive turn off notice. Uh, I believe the turn. So uh, we do are still sending turn off notices. So so I can tell you in the context of residential, um, someone might get a turn off notice because 
um, if they get a turn off notice, it actually helps them apply for public benefits mm. um, uh, as, a, as a residential customer. So we won't necessarily turn it off uh, or follow through with that. And people have our guarantee that we won't do that for residential. Uh, I believe the same is true for uh, commercial that we are still sending shut off notices, but our policy is still in place that we won't be doing shut offs. And Matt, Matt Sniffen, I don't know if you have uh, more color on that for commercial residential. I believe you're correct, uh, Pat. Mm -hmm. There is some, some there, there is some benefit to them getting the turn off notice for them to apply for assistance, but we are not turning anyone off uh, through the summer. No, but I'm talking about commercial tenants, the like restaurants, the like same thing. Uh, uh, same thing apply, but, but I have received two. The uh, one guy showed me two turn off notice from them. Yeah, we're still sending the notices. I know it's confusing, uh, but we are still sending the notices. But we are not turning anyone off. President, so they can ignore it. They can ignore the turn off notice. If I wouldn't say ignore it, but I would say yeah, yeah. For like I said, residential folks needed it before uh, benefits, and but we're not turning commercial customers off, so they can do what they want with it. And also, I am reading a bill from from um, from Connison. Besides your supply, you have a lot of charges. You know, supply yeah. charges, delivery charges, and under the supply charge, there are like four different charges. Under the delivery charges, you have like four different charges too. It's like everything a la car. You know, it's not. So how can you charge a basic service charge processing the uh, the the payment, yeah, I had to pay a uh, dollar twenty eight for the for you guys to process my charge. I send you a check, you charge me a twenty dollar twenty eight, or I, even I have the direct deposit, you charge me a dollar twenty eight for processing the charge. And then you have a merchant function charge, uh, other charge, sales tax. This is like almost a forty percent of the bill. So I I wish. My, other people can do business like you. So you turn all the charges to other people. So I think we have to look into this, how you cut off these uh, uh, charges. You have too many charges. We, uh, I'm happy, on, to sit with you and, happy to sit with you and walk through the bill many times. Uh, it, it, it can be confusing, I agree. Um, but you have, the best you, way to how think about- How do you have a delivery charge and a supply charge? So the supply charge is the cost of the electricity itself. We yeah, I understand make, that. Yeah, we don't make yeah. any electricity. We just send it to you on your behalf. Buy on your behalf, um, and so that's the supply charge. The delivery charge is money we're spending to uh, improve the system, uh, pay for the fixed costs of having an electricity um, operator, and then third is taxes to the city. Those are that's that's essentially the cost of delivery. So besides customers pay for the sales tax, right? Every customer pay for sales tax for the charges. And you guys pay for the sales tax too, to the city? I mean, you- Yeah, we pay property taxes to the city. I mean, no, no, every year, what kind of tax you pay to the city as a company? 1.9 billion public, huh? uh, $1 billion to the city. For, for what, for your profit? For profit. Time expired. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Council Member Koo. Next, we will hear from Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Ampre Samuel. Council Member Lander. Time starts thank now. You. Thank you to the chairs and uh, Kyle and Patrick and team. It's, it's good to see you. Um, I wanna ask a little more about how you're thinking about your own emergency preparedness. And I guess kind of two sub questions. Kyle, I was intrigued by your point that one challenge you might face if you have an emergency event this summer is constrained ability to work uh, together in a space in the way that you have traditionally done. Of course, for you guys, that's especially risky because an event could mean a power outage that affected our ability to communicate together through Zoom and other uh, communications technology. So I guess I want to know kind of what tabletop work you guys have done to think about how you would do emergency response given the COVID challenges in the case of an outage. 
And then my second question is just this whole COVID crisis, which obviously I and you know I think most of us did not see coming, has me thinking about risks and what the um, potential crisis events are in a whole new way. And so I just wonder if you could walk us through how you guys do that. Like, what do you guys see this summer, but I guess also in general as like the scenarios that hold the most potential for causing some catastrophic impact and what kinds of um, preparedness and response planning have you engaged? And I agree that all of the investment work you're talking about in order to prevent those things from happening is critical. I'm sure with Justin on that, but you know, we see how far beyond our control things are. So um, I guess if you could answer those two questions, one kind of generally, what are the risk scenarios and how are you guys trying to be ready to respond to them and to um, the, the particular challenges of doing that amidst this summer when we can't just all get together um, and the response challenges that that causes? So Kyle, I'll take these. Uh, so so uh, my organization is Emergency Preparedness. So Great, you're thank at, you. who's thinking about this and, and we're partnering with many of the city agencies. So while Kyle said it would be difficult to uh, you know, get all of our organizations in one room, <clears throat> we, we have set up two scenarios. One where we'd be totally remote, much like we're doing today, using Microsoft Teams in our case. We hold meetings like this every day that we never did, you know, three or four months ago, right? Uh, and then we have a um, one with semi-remote where we'll put groups of folks in different rooms in our headquarters. Uh, we're, we're standing by the no more than 10 folks, but our command staff would be together, say, and then their support staff would be in different rooms throughout the building. And we're drilling on that, right? So we've set up that scenario already. We actually had one fairly large uh, storm already uh, during the pandemic, about 30,000 customers out. And we did it totally remotely through our command staff. We did not have to muster. We did it remotely. Some of our engineering folks who had been working from home came in to support things like printing and things like that. But we were able to effectively manage the storm, uh, actually, and got accolades for restoring 30,000 customers, mostly in West Coast, to be honest, but that's typically where we have the bigger problems with storms. So we were able to manage that. We're drilling different scenarios right now. There's a variety of different risks on top of, you know, the pandemic itself is a risk to our employees. We've had a number of our employees uh, affected, as you can imagine. Uh, but we are also looking at things like the fact that we have 8,000 of our employees typically working remotely right now. The effect of a communications issue right now is, has brought that uh, uh, risk to light, right? Where normally we're working in our own building, the majority of our folks do not work from home, but our, our essential support teams are now working remotely. And uh, we're certainly dependent, uh, like all the others, on that, uh, as well as electricity, right? We, we need electricity in our homes as well. Uh, so we certainly appreciate our own community during these events as well. So. Well, but we are, we're drilling, we're working with the, uh, the, the uh, mayor's office of resiliency, the OEM, to work on different scenarios, how we're going to communicate during events, uh, and we're building on uh, our relationships uh, really on a daily basis. And I, just as a follow-up, so I, I know that obviously at your headquarters, you know, in the event of a major blackout or something, I assume you have a backup power plan to be able to keep going and coordinate in order to address it. But obviously that's a big challenge, just as you say, that if you've got people everywhere spread out and they're in the areas that might be hit, uh, you can't give them a, a backup, I, I assume. So what, what sort of planning right. have you done to address that? So, so our buildings are ready to accept our employees back. Uh, so, in the, so I described that one storm we had, a number of our, our, our employees lost power and they, they came into the, the facility, maintained social distancing, and effectively work on in our facility. You're right, do have backup generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Time expired. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Next, we will hear from Council Member Amprey Samuel, followed by Council Member Chin. Council Member Amprey Samuel. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Uh, so first, I want to say thanks for the information that you provided related to NYCHA and the conversations that you've had with the administration. But of course, when, when we're talking about NYCHA, you can't, it can't be referred to as like a, a total monolith because NYCHA developments in Chelsea is different from NYCHA developments on the Upper East Side. And uh, for me in particular, I know Kyle already know the question I'm going to ask is related to the NYCHA developments that are within the BQDM. 
Um, and we already know that the reason why, you know, there were so many conversations around the Brooklyn Queens demand, um, demand management um, response process was related to all of the complaints and different things um, like over usage of the grid. And, you know, at times we complained about the elevators not going up and then finding out it was because of, of the turning down of the voltage and nitro developments. You already know all the concerns and in, in, in conversations. Um, so can you just, just can you just explain to me what's happening with the BQDM? And um, can you explain what's going on within the same conversation as to what's happening in East New York and in Brownsville with the um, high concentration of public housing, again, different from other NYCHA developments and um, within an already highly dense community and the fact that we already know that the rollout of the ACs a lot of it started within East New York, and um, I'm hearing a lot of numbers coming out of Boulevard houses, which is part of the BQDM. So can you just give us a sense of what's happening um, with that program, the process itself, um, and the conversation that you're having with the city? So it's about NYCHA as well as the BQDM and what you're doing, what the conversation is, what the plans are, because you already know the issues that we face last year and the years before and when this all started back in 2014. Sure, Patrick, do you want to start? Well, so I, I guess the BQ, the BQDM effort was really uh, an effort around uh, that region of Brooklyn, Queens to help drive down load due to a substation issue. Um, you know, that was, we were trying to drive down customer usage in that area to address concern of supply into the area as opposed to local residential areas. And I think it was, you know, very, very successful, uh, that effort to help do that. Um, I guess in, in general, we talk about uh, the NYCHA developments, whether it, wherever they are, um, we, we will continue to work with them to make sure that there's, there's streets supply power into development, and then there's internal development, you know, development wiring. And we got to continue to work with NYCHA together as a team to understand problems and issues and make sure that we're solving the correct problem uh, when there's issues going on. Uh, we do look to make information more readily available. We have had reduced voltage situations uh, where we had to reduce voltage as a neighborhood gets into a, a contingency condition where an escalating um, position may be developing. But um, we continue to, to uh, let people know about that. Um, we continue to work with NYCHA to make sure we're identifying any issues uh, ahead of time. And I would I say more specific. Okay, yeah. go. Because you're ready. This was the, this. So we've had this conversation before, which is why there was a, a focus and the response effort um, around this particular region. And so now that we are in the middle of COVID, now that we have this increased demand, now we have so many of those same families, that, which, which has already been articulated by my colleagues. I'm just saying specific to the BQDM, what are the plans? Because we're, we're kind of back to where we were in 2013, 2014, with all of the efforts that you put in to this program and all the money that was spent on this program and all the partnerships with all of the different community stakeholders and businesses, so knowing that we're in the middle of this and knowing that now you have all these ACs on top of it, it's especially in that East New York area. So it's, it's, it sounds like it would be more than just, you know, oh, we're gonna have conversations and talk about it with the administration. I'm asking, you already know what happened. So you can, for, you know, this is, so what are we doing to address it because you already know what it was before. The, what I would add to Patrick Patrick's uh, statement was, you know, um, BQDM uh, was incredibly helpful for us uh, in terms of, and, and incredibly helpful to our customers in terms of offsetting uh, expenses of a, a very expensive uh, of substation, uh, but also demonstrating the principle that we do need people to use energy more efficiently. And so to answer your question, we're taking a lot of, BQDM is still very important to us. Uh, in, our, in our last, in this current rate case that was just approved, um, a big component of that rate case is time energy. expired. And so in going, so the answer to your question in terms of what's next is going deeper, doing deeper levels of efficiency with residential customers uh, and commercial customers um, and getting really just going deeper, right? And continuing to do that and spreading the lessons that we took from BQDM and are taking from BQDM uh, and extrapolating those across the city to different parts of town. 
Um, and then lastly on NYCHA, the piece is um, we have a dedicated person within Con Edison who focuses solely on NYCHA issues uh, and understands the developments, works closely with Patrick on making sure we're making the right investments. Um, but also we've done a lot of work with NYCHA on the voltage issue. So as, as we talked about in the presentation at the beginning, one of the second to last resorts is voltage reduction. So that's really just kind of turning down the volume of the system in certain areas uh, so that the wires have a chance to uh, cool off a little bit. Um, most people don't see a difference in voltage, um, but those with older equipment, uh, for example, a NYCHA elevator might see its settings um, affected. And so what we've done is work closely with NYCHA to one, let them know about voltage reductions and so in having a dedicated communication channel during a voltage reduction, but in advance of a voltage reduction, we've spent a lot of time with them, helping them reset the settings on their elevators, um, but also making capacity upgrades that Patrick talked about. So the voltage issues are not necessarily uh, as much of an issue, but if they are helping them with the settings on their equipment um, so that they are less impacted. Um, so ha having a dedicated focus on NYCHA, really understanding those problems, trying to deal with each development as an individual case, as you mentioned, but then largely also taking the lessons from BQDM and really going deeper on energy efficiency, because that's really important to us as a company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Amphrey Samuel. Next, we will hear from Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Holden. Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, thank you to the co chairs, and thank you to all the Connet representatives. I have a couple of questions. One is also following up uh, about NYCHA, because I have a lot of NYCHA development. Uh, in my district, and they're like one of the oldest ones um, in the city. Um, they were severely affected by Superstorm Sandy. And some of them actually um, have generators installed now um, on the rooftop. Um, so can you just like give me some more specific in terms of how are you working with some of the uh, NYCHA development uh, in Lower Manhattan, like Smith, Rutgers, LaGuardia, um, in those development. Uh, the second issue is that we also have a lot of senior buildings, uh, affordable housing, Section 8 building, Mitchell Lama building. They're all very old and, um, and their infrastructures are very old. And so if you could talk a little bit about how are you working with them uh, to upgrade uh, their equipment, any support that you're providing, and the third thing is all these um, tenement buildings um, in Chinatown, the Lower East Side, a lot of them are over 100 years old. Um, every time um, there's a heat wave, everybody plug into the air condition, the thing blows up. Uh, so are you working also with HPD and with this landlord to really try to upgrade their electricity so that we don't see tragic fire or like service disruption, especially during a heat wave. Thank you. So I'll take the first part, Kyle, and I'll <clears throat> go over to you. I mean, we continue to work with NYCHA. As Kyle mentioned, we went this year, we going over a year ago, we dedicated a lead person whose function was to meet with NYCHA and to study problems and review problems that, that they would want us to be making sure we're, we're digging into. So, and that was help lead to those 29 uh, development, those 29 locations we upgraded for this summer. Uh, we continue to work with them to, to do that. On a separate basis, we prioritize all of our structures that feed, these underground structures that feed NYCHA developments. So we prioritize those, that they get more inspections, we do more engineering reviews on those. So we give it a, a, a definitely a better or more significant review and look at the NYCHA developments. Uh, I would say that what you, you mentioned there though is the, the developments themselves have a lot of internal wiring as well. So we need to continue, you know, that, that's beyond our scope, uh, but we need to continue to work with NYCHA to uh, be working to upgrade the internal wiring, 
uh, to be ready for the, the, you know, the summer loads, that the demand that, that, that is placed upon it. So Kyle, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, I, 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 I would echo what you said, which is, you know, our, our, our scope is really working on the wires in the streets. Um, and to the extent uh, like large developments like NYCHA, we've worked pretty closely on internal wiring. We do not, I think as a matter of course, consult with specific buildings uh, as, a, as, a, like a, as, a, as a policy matter, you know, focusing on Mitchell Lama or uh, tenement style buildings uh, in terms of wholesale advice on upgrading their own internal equipment or what we would call customer equipment. We of course work with them on it, as they request additional service, um, but we are, are really, we kind of uh, don't really focus on the internal wiring within buildings uh, as part of our scope. But can you do that? Because they're your customers. And in order you know, to utilize your expertise and working with the city to make sure that your customer get the services that they deserve. I mean, a lot of these buildings are very old. And if Con Ed has the expertise and the resources to help, um, that's what we expect you to do. Because otherwise there is gonna be tragedy and we have seen it. You know, when it overloads, you know, the fires, it's because of everybody plucking in uh, during the winter, pl plucking in a heating system and the summer, everybody, you know, plucking in their air conditioning. So I think that's something that's a corporate responsibility. I hope that you would really look into partnering with the city and really provide uh, some support and resources and your expertise to really help solve Time this issue. expired. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Next, we will hear from Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Menchaca. Council Member Holden. Time starts now. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks you chairs and thanks uh, to all the Con Ed folks for the testimony. Um, I just want to talk about smart meter uh, installation. You, you said it's resuming. Um, National Grid installed smart meters almost 10 years ago. Um, what took Con Ed so long? And my second question related to that is why, what does this mean in the um, access to homes, like in the initial installation of the smart meters? So the first piece is that uh, there's different types of smart meters. Uh, there's what's called AMR or, or AMI. Um, and we are installing the latest technology uh, called AMI, which is essentially we are putting uh, a meter inside a home that communicates back to Con Edison without us having to drive by. Um, that also in involved um, or us having to visit the home at all. Um, and what that means is we had to create a mesh network in, in partnership with the city using uh, street lamps. Um, we had to go through a number of different processes, uh, but, and we've obviously rolled out the installation to do that. But so what uh, National Grid may have installed is a very different type of automatic meter reading that still involved uh, a physical intervention. I would say second is that um, we only got approval for this from the PSC about, uh, I guess maybe five or six years ago. Uh, but the, what we are installing is the latest technology and it is a very different product than uh, really any other utility has. So, so have you started to install this? Uh... So what we're doing, sorry, yes, the second part of your question is, so we, we did suspend uh, AMI installations during the COVID crisis. Um, we are um, in figuring out as a company how to begin those installations because we want uh, really to get that back on track. Um, so what we're doing now is uh, we're probably going to resume uh, AMI installations with those that we can do from the outside. Uh, so there are a number of people have uh, meters on the outside of their homes that we can uh, replace those without any interaction with the customer. Um, 
The second is we'll do big meter banks. So there's certain buildings that have that are, you know, the higher density buildings have all the meters in the basement. Um, so we will uh, make appointments with customers, reconfirm the appointments that we already have, uh, and then go in and replace those meter banks uh, inside high de higher density buildings. Uh, and then the last stage will be uh, the one-off residential customer where we have to ring the doorbell and go into someone's basement. And, we'll, and hopefully that will be towards the latter part of the summer. With all of those interactions, we're gonna have the proper PPE. Uh, we've been working on um, ways to let customers know that we're coming, uh, you know, ring the doorbell, step back, we're gonna have masks, gloves, that kind of thing, uh, different PPE in place um, to ensure the customer feels uh, safe uh, through that interaction. It, it is, believe it or not, it's a big issue in my district. We have a lot of seniors who, um, are susceptible to these scams where people come to the door posing as con ed meter readers and get into and then obviously burglarize the house. So this is, um, when do you expect this whole process to be finished with the installation of these smart meters for the whole city? Um, there is a component, uh, I, uh, I can come back to you. The timeline has moved a little bit, but we're, we're about 60 or 70% done uh, with the smart meters. So we're, we're pretty close. Um, and, but I, so I'd say we are hoping to be done with this certainly within 2021. All right. And just, I just want to talk about that rate increase because um, I think now um, to have a electrical rate increase uh, that Con Ed is, is proposing is kind of a kick in the head to New Yorkers. Uh, I don't think now's the time. I think this should be postponed at least until we're past the pandemic. Um, but because, you know, my let me just talk about my district for a second. Then I'll, that's my last question. I have a lot of uh, my electrical service uh, is mostly overhead wires, like some of the other council members had uh, mentioned. We have outages every summer, especially, uh, especially during storms. Um, will the rate increase, you know, because I ask this question every year to Con Ed, will, you know, we're going to pay a rate increase. Can we expect fewer outages? And I always get the answer is yes but we, we still see, it looks like the same amount. Um, is the investment in the, in the overhead, are we, you know, the transformers are usually the, the things that get hit by lightning or some other uh, problem. Can we expect better service with the rate increase? So we are, we are consistently recognized. I think it's important to address this narrative of- I'm expired of the, the outages. We are consistently recognized by the data um, that's provided to the PSC that we are the most reliable utility in the United States. Uh, and that is in part because we have designed an underground network that has two contingencies. Uh, and then we have an overhead system that is also has a number of contingencies built in. Um, so of any utility in an urban environment, we are considered to be the most reliable and investor and, and our customers have paid for that um, and are paying for that through their through their bills. Um, having said that, uh, you, you're always going to have outages. Um, there is no system in the world that does not have outages, and that's because there's a lot of things that cause outages. Sometimes it's equipment failure, sometimes it's animals, sometimes it's mylar balloons, sometimes a car hits a pole. The things that we can control are the equipment that we invest in, and we feel like that the every year that we make investments in the system, it's making the system that much more um, reliable. Uh, and we, we continue to invest and hope to improve upon that. Having said that, summer does bring challenges um, because people are using electricity a lot more, especially relative to winter. And so investment has to be coupled with efficiency. Um, so we have to have, make sure that people are using their energy more efficiently. Um, and that's why we, are hoping that people will install uh, energy efficient air conditioners, for example, those uh, or, or, or smaller units, for example. Um, but yes, investment in this system does yield a more reliable system. Um, having said that, there is nothing that's foolproof. Uh, and so if there are outages, we also spend time making sure that the outages are as short as possible and that we are communicating with people as best as possible so they know what to anticipate. Thank you very much, Council Member Holden. And now we will hear from Council Member Menchaca. Time starts now. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Kyle and team. I wanted to ask uh, about the usage um, comment that you made about usage being lower in residential areas than commercial zones. Uh, what is the peak usage at NYCHA houses, uh, like in Red Hook, for example? And at what point does the grid overload to the point that it shuts down? <clears throat> okay, so I, I don't have statistics in front of me of, of what a specific location is and what it peaks is. A, a typical residential uh, load, depending on if the person, if, if the group people are working, not working, there's different load curves on when those uh, peaks occur. And many times a residential peak may not occur when the local area is peaking. You may have a building using its peak energy consumption, but the local area around it had peaked at 5 p.m. But yet this building now peaks later on in the day or 8, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, many areas of Brooklyn, Queens peak at 10 or 11, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night when the sun's down. And that's one of the description when we talk about solar. Okay, we all solve that problem. Well, solar during a lot of the areas that uh, in Queens and Brooklyn, when the system is peaking, the sun is already down. So, and it doesn't really hit it. Just um, the system design, say that an area is going to, uh, is forecast to see a certain amount of megawatts. When it goes over that limit, it doesn't shut down. Uh, the equipment just, uh, the equipment is designed for multiple contingencies. To, for can I, to can I pause you really quick? Um, and, and I'll say, uh, thanks for kind of review on the technology piece. If you could get back to us on, on what Red Hook looks like and a Red Hook, it has, uh, has vulnerable, uh, equipment and infrastructure. And so the houses become a really important thing to review. Um, okay. So if we can get back on more specific, can, especially NYCHA across the, the, the kind of city would be great. I'm looking for Red Hook. And what lessons did we learn from 2019 um, that Con Ed implemented to prevent further blackouts? So I would so so if you take the the two issues, one is we we thoroughly investigated both events, the Midtown West and the Flushing event. Uh, the Midtown West, we identified the root cause of that problem, which ended up, you know, which was a result of a relay miswiring. So uh, the relay miswiring resulted in losing those stations, and we identified that. We isolated those relays around the system, around and verifying the wiring every single installation that that relay is present. So um, that was the one lesson learned. The second is flushing. Flushing, there was a number, uh, not flushing, but Flatbush. We had a number of events that led to a cascading condition. So uh, part of it was cable failures and we worked to upgrade cable failures in, in that area of Flatbush as well as across the city. And we, we worked to do that every summer. We also work to uh, install more sectionalizing switches to allow us to, if problems develop, to quickly sectionalize that, um, that issue to allow us to respond better. And added new technology there to make the operations, uh, you know, to be the operators more effective in uh, trying to respond to events. So That's those, great. Those I, th thanks for that, that list. I think what uh, in Red Hook and Sunset Park, I think we're, we're having a lot of conversations about solar and, and with the NYCHA uh, Sandy project. I think a lot of people are interested in talking with all of you about summer in Red Hook as well. So maybe we can follow up on, on that later. And then I think the final question I have is, um, what are the financial relief plans you are offering to commercial customers who do use higher usage? And I'm thinking about restaurants in, in particular. So right now, our bill relief programs are focused on low and moderate income uh, residential customers. Um, right now, we are not uh, we have not necessarily designed or, or considering a program uh, for commercial tenants. You're not looking at it. Um, right now, we're basically focused on yeah. Right now, we're just I would say we're we're focused on on residential, both bill relief, air conditioners. Uh, but right now for commercial tenants, we are not suspending, um, we're not suspending terminations.
right now. Is that is that something that you all time expired? To start looking at. Uh, I think it's something we could we could certainly we could certainly talk talk about, and I think we'll be we'll be can talk will be talked about. Right now, our focus is on residential customers. Thank you very much, Council Member Menchaca. I will now turn it back to the chairs for additional questions, if they have any. Chair Cohen. Uh, I do just have a, a couple. Um, could you, because uh, I, I think there was some, uh, or there's been some lack of clarity on the difference between maintenance and capital. Could you talk about how you define those two, those, those two concepts in, in, in maintaining the grid uh, and, and what the breakdown is on what you spend? So uh, I'll take that. So, the ma so maintenance, how we define maintenance is maintenance is where we go out there and go out to a location and we will take the piece of equipment and we will inspect and make minor modifications to it could be a network switch that needs uh, either some lubrications, parts changed, or something like that. That would be a maintenance type uh, effort. And capital efforts are efforts where we take a, com a component on the system and we replace it. We replace a switch, we replace a section of cable. Uh, those would be a capital investment uh, between the two. We, we spend on, uh, the capital investments, the upgrades, we, we said we spent about 1.3 billion. I believe the maintenance is in the area. I believe it's around 500 million, um, about rough numbers. Uh, when you talked, or I don't know if it was you or Kyle talked about um, sort of city mandated uh, uh, moving infrastructure, is that capital or is that maintenance? What column does that fall into? It would be in both. Um, if we're required to move the asset and put in new assets, that would be a capital investment. If it's something that we may need to just support or do something where the asset stays, uh, that would be a maintenance type effort. The bigger uh, portion of the case is capital. Capital. Uh, uh, just also, I wanna, uh, I think that my colleague, uh, Council Member Menchaca hit on a very important part um, I think that uh, in the, you know, obviously small business has been devastated by COVID. Um, and I, and I, I admit we're still, you know, everybody's got protections in place at the moment. The courts are, are not really uh, taking any actions, uh, but, but that's going to come at some point. And it would be a shame if the difference between keeping a neighborhood business and not keeping a neighborhood business was an outstanding Con Ed bill, you know, a, a turnoff uh, for COVID related uh, charges. So uh, I think it's really important that the, that, that you uh, understand that, you know, it's one, you know, just like you're one big network, the city is a, is a network and small businesses play a vital role in, in keeping it going. So we're gonna need a thoughtful response from Con Ed on how to deal with this going forward. Uh, with that, I think council member Brandon has some questions too. Thank you, Chair. Uh, really quick, um, what, what, as far as preparation, what is the, the difference in preparation, say, for, um, you know, experts are predicting that this is going to be an incredibly active hurricane season. Um, and last summer, I know we had some heavy rains, which apparently caused outages in Queens. Um, what measures is Con Ed taking to ensure that um, we don't have outages as it relates to, to hurricanes and weather versus um, with increased demand from people staying home because of the pandemic. Is, is, that, is that something that you guys think about differently or is it all one and the same? So I think we think about it differently. I mean, so we've done a lot uh, to prepare for those, you know, the, those storms or those weather events. The weather events primarily impact the overhead system uh, I'll flip it to Matt in a second, but generally we've, we've worked to um, secure more resources ahead of time, worked on the process of securing more resources, worked on the communication during those events, um, and we've spent you know, a lot of effort and time, and, and it is preparing for two different type of things. It's, it's a, a heat event is really 
for the most part driven by underground feed reliability and an overhead event is, is really driven by tree contact. So Matt, you want to add a little more to that? Yeah, so key components. So, we, you know, we do have outages during storms, whether it be a lightning storm or a, a, a tropical uh, event like a, like a hurricane, we will have outages. But the investment we've made since really uh, Superstorm Sandy have decreased the effects by 20 to 25%, right? We make investments uh, that will further sectionalize our equipment. So a, a tree coming down and knocking out a, a thousand customers would knock out typically under 500. And we'd be able to mobilize that problem either further through remote control switches. So we've invested a lot in remote control capability over the last few years has increased even since the the, uh, the storms of 2017 with Riley and Quinn. Uh, so we continue to make investments in our overhead system, make it more resilient, put up more resilient wire, larger poles, and we've been doing that throughout our system uh, really since uh, Superstorm Sandy. So, um, uh, but the other part of it is assets uh, restore. We, we have uh, emergency contracts that uh, for over 500 uh, contract resources. Uh, because of the nature of overhead storms, there are uh, certainly a lot of utilities looking for those assets. And we have a right of first refusal with uh, over 500 of those resources right now, which will, would aid the, uh, our existing overhead workforce and the contractors we have on the property every day uh, with an additional up to 500 uh, people that we bring in uh, to respond to the storm. Our storm process is is drilled annually. It has been drilled during the pandemic as well. And I mentioned prior, we did have a have a storm where we did things differently, where instead of having a large staging area, we used hotels for staging areas, one person to a room, and did all of our onboarding with those crews remotely through Microsoft Teams. So it, it evolves. We're at, we're having another drill in the next couple of weeks on a large scale storm uh, that we will do through a tabletop exercise. Uh, through Microsoft Teams. And how will how will social distancing impact your response to outages? Um, so, in in a few ways, we have already separated our main response crews, our overhead crews. I'll refer to them that way. Instead of all working in one yard, they work uh, in in multiple locations. They might pull out of one of our substations. They take two vehicles out. We have rented vehicles, so they don't have to ride together. They uh, they may take out their own vehicles. So we're, we're safeguarding our own crews that way, right? So we don't want one employee getting sick, taking somebody else out. <clears throat> so that's a very important piece. Uh, we, we expect the same from our contractors and that's built into the costs when we bring in contractors. I mentioned before about onboarding. When uh, we bring crews in, we give them safety messages. We you know, talk to them about how we work, give them supplies, right? That's all done now remotely. And then we meet up with them, uh, help them get material always maintaining that social distancing or with masks where we can't. So uh, we're very, very conscious of that uh, every day, not just during storms. Okay, last question for me. Um, uh, in terms of uh, priorities when it comes to smart meters, I, we hear a lot of stories from constituents who have summer Con Ed bills that are three to $400 and something seems to be off with their energy uses. Is there any um, focus being given to you know, and as far as equity is concerned with figuring out folks that might have something wonky going on with their uh, electricity bills to, to ensure they're, they're being billed properly, fairly? Yeah, we've, we've had a number of people um, who have, uh, once they have a smart meter, there's, they feel like there's uh, something, as you said, wonky. And we've take a look at all of them and we'll send someone out. Um, oftentimes has been the case, is that the, the, what was wonky was actually their meter before um, that has been replaced. Um, but we were happy to come out and, and, and we do look at all inquiries. If, there's, if there seems to be some issue with the bill that it's, seems off. It's primarily complaint driven, right? Like there's nothing on your end that, that you can pick up on before a customer complains about it? Um, that I don't know. I think maybe on the margins, probably, you know, if there's a small change, maybe, you know, I think there's some flagging if there's, you know, large energy uses or some, there is some flagging there, but, um, probably those of us who are more sensitive to money issues, um, 
you know, a, a hundred dollar difference perhaps, or, you know, $50 difference that might need to be complaint driven, but I can look into what our process is. I don't know if you know anything, Patrick. No, just, uh, I guess also that when we deploy the meters, we do it in areas because the meters use each other meters to communicate. So you can't suddenly go, you know, to a block where there's no other meters installed yet. You need to kind of install them in mass and then they can all communicate well together. So that's a little bit of how the process is marched around the city to put them in. But once a complaint occurs or if there's an issue, we, we want to make sure we resolve and make sure people are only getting billed what they're using. And uh, we are committed to make sure that that is what they're being billed for. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Council Member Levine has a question for Con Ed. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And very briefly, I'm just going to ask two questions quickly so we can move on. Um, given that we're about to deploy 22,000 city funded air conditioning units in public housing, I wonder if, if Con Ed or anyone has done an assessment on the electrical capacity to handle that in our developments. Um, uh, the, the, the worst thing would be for us to deploy that uh, that equipment and uh, not be able uh, for it not to function because of, of antiquated infrastructure. And, and secondly, uh, on the question of meters, I'm presuming that because of social distancing concerns, you're not sending uh, in-person inspectors out at all or not frequently in recent months. Um, and I'm wondering if that might mean that some people are stuck with uh, monthly bills, which are are um, pretty far off from their actual usage. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Con Ed, for responses on both of those. Thank you. So the, the for answer to the second one first is, uh, we did stop meter reading, which will we, so we're not going into premises where that required us to go in. So people are getting estimated billing. So that will be a, a you know, could be a concern when things are trued up at a, at a future date. Um, so that's, that's that part of it. The first part of it was your question on the air conditions around NYCHA. So we've been working with the city, trying to stay in touch with where they're going. Um, you know, us to run a study, we are looking to see how many are going in which buildings and how those are, those are being done. So we want to run those studies. Uh, when you run a study, you need information. Uh, we are looking to get the information of this complex, how many air conditioners are going to be installed. We don't have that granularity at this point. Uh, it's gonna be a study that needs to be both done internally and externally on the grid. So um, we would, of course, would look at the grid pers pers uh, perspective on that, but both uh, internally, NYCHA would have to look at what problems that may create internally. We look at, we've asked as we've done this is to keep the air conditions. We, we would push in uh, to stay to a 6,000 to 8,000 BTU high efficiency air conditioner. That is uh, typically about a 0.6 kilowatt if it's a high efficiency air conditioner, which is uh, you know about the size of a, a hair dryer. So if you get a small efficient unit, um, you know it's it's it really doesn't have a lot of impact until you put a whole bunch of them in one one location. And we really want to work with the city on where a bunch of them will go in one location, and then work to adjust as we can when we see that. Like obviously the nature of this is everyone runs them at the same time, right? They all run them on a hot day. So uh, that, that uh, the that, that, that's the problem. Uh, we'll ask the next, uh, the administration momentarily about timing, but I sure hope we're deploying these uh, soon in a matter of weeks because it's going to get hot in June. Uh, so what, what is the timing on the study? You're, you're, you're telling us that you can't proceed because you're waiting for information from the administration. Is that right? So, so I'd say we, we right away got out of the shoot and did 29 locations already that we upgraded those. Uh, so working with NYCHA, we upgraded 29 already. We are, we, we want to make sure we're doing the right work. So we want the information, us running out and doing stuff that we think may be happening is not going to be good for anybody. So uh, we're, we're looking for that information. So we, the, the studies are, are relatively quick, you know, within a day, once I, I get it, a building can be done and analyzed. Uh, the, the work that may come out of it is the concern and what, what will be the response uh, right. based on that. 
Okay, we'll ask the administration about some of these questions, but it would be great if you could deliver to us uh, whatever kind of reporting you produce so that we can have confidence in all of us as council members that the developments in our district are gonna be served uh, by this important program. Can we count on you to share those reports with us? We, we will share everything that we, we, we learn that when okay. we, we give that information, anything we learn and any, any locations we identify, we'd be willing to share uh, that information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, back to you. No problem. Uh, Council Member Colombo I mean, has one more question. Oops. I should be on. Council Member Brennan has just one more question. Thank you, Chair. I just I just wanted to get on the record, and, and if you if you already said it, I apologize, but I don't think you did. Last year, uh, Con Ed preemptively cut power in the out of boroughs because of stress on the grid. Um, do, do we think this is going to happen again? And how will customers and elected officials be notified before the fact? And last question, how do we decide which areas get cut? Well, Patrick, I'll take the communication piece because uh, my, <clears throat> my group in Emergency Preparedness is working on that. We established a jointly established a communication protocol. The city now gets notification of every single feeder outage. When we go into a second contingency where we might start to escalate and start doing some of our preemptive steps, we have a conversation at that level to start explaining what what type of contingency we're in and what steps are planned and when. Uh, previously, that did not happen to at least a third contingency, if not greater. So we're having a lot more conversations planned, as well as every single feeder notification they get now uh, automatically. So when I get it, they get it. It's you know, there's no human intervention. And uh, the conversations will be through my, my organization and uh, the city's uh, emergency management and the mayor's office of resiliency. And, and just to answer the second part of the question in terms of what area, uh, what, what part, uh, I think this is a, Patrick gave a, a very detailed analysis of what happened last summer, but the, the upshot is if there is a problem in a specific area, um, mostly an underground area, uh, load shedding, which is a very much a last resort, which hasn't been done in a very, very long time prior to last summer, uh, is done to correct a problem in that specific area. So for example, they wouldn't load shed uh, Bay Ridge to create a problem, to correct a problem in uh, Williamsburg. If there's a problem in Williamsburg, they could potentially load shed load in Williamsburg in that specific part of the network. But again, that's, that is a last resort and it comes after all different kinds of appeals to customers to use less energy. Um, and again, it hasn't been done in a very long time. And I think in the case of Flatbush last year, there was a lot of consternation and, and concern with this council and others that we weren't able to tell people what was going on. And so what Matt just talked about in the first part is gonna make it a little bit easier for us to communicate with the city emergency management earlier in terms of what's going on, but we didn't make a decision to shed load in Flatbush until I believe it was the sixth contingency. And uh, what Matt just talked about is that we would start notifying the city and the, that there is a third contingency, so three steps. But mind you that the, the time elapsed between those contingencies starts happening faster and faster. And so the decision last year to shed the load happened in a couple of minutes. Uh, which would not have been something that we uh, would have been able to effectively communicate with any electeds about, about what was going on because it happened very quickly. Certainly not something we had planned to do for that day, um, but because we got into a situation in the cascading situation that Patrick talked about, uh, it, happened, it can happen very quickly at a certain point. And so, you know, it happens within tens of minutes, not, uh, not 60s of minutes. But we, at the same time, the communication protocols kick in before that with emergency management. And shortly thereafter, we are going to improve our, we are committed to improving our communication, you know, as quickly as possible, hopefully before an event, but certainly very quickly afterwards. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Brennan. Uh, I want to 
thank Con Ed uh, for uh, participating this morning. Uh, I just briefly, um, I, I think that you were going to follow up on the 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 shutoff data of customers. I, I'm interested in that both commercial and residential. I think that that's important. You know, annualized how many customers get shut off, and and I, and again, I, I just want to stress. I think it's important that Con Ed come up with some kind of policy as related to commercial customers uh, who uh, are behind in their bills uh, as we try to revive the New York City economy that Con Ed, just like everybody else in the city is dependent on. So uh, I appreciate uh, your time. I'm gonna just double check because I'm getting some direction from the committee. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to committee council uh, to call the next panel. Thank you, Con Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cohen. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. First, Commissioner Criswell, followed by Director Bavishi. Assistant Commissioner Olson, Deputy Director Suzanne DeRoche, and Deputy Director Kizzy Charles Guzman will be able to answer questions. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Criswell, Director Bavishi, Assistant Commissioner Olson, excuse me, Deputy Director DeRoche, and Deputy Director Charles Guzman. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions. Commissioner Criswell. Yes. Director Bavishi. Yes. Assistant Commissioner Olson. Yes. Deputy Director DeRoche. Yes. And Deputy Director Charles Guzman. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Criswell, you may begin to testify when ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairpersons Cohen, Brannon, Constantinidas and Levine and members of the committees on consumer affairs and business licensing, waterfronts and resiliency, environmental protection and health. I am Deanne Criswell and I am happy to be here today in my role as commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. I am joined by members of the administration, including Janie Bavishi, director of the mayor's office of resiliency, Carolyn Olson, Assistant Commissioner in the Bureau of Environmental Surveillance and Policy at the Department for Health and Mental Hygiene, and Suzanne DeRoche, Deputy Director, Energy and Infrastructure, Mayor's Office of Sustainability. It has been an unprecedented time in New York City, indeed around the world. City government has worked tirelessly with our partners at all levels. While we have made significant progress against COVID-19, much work remains and we keep working to ensure the safety and security of New Yorkers. We realized early on in our response to COVID-19 that this was going to be a marathon and not a sprint. And we established the Cascading Impacts team. This team has spent months looking over the horizon at response challenges in a COVID-19 world and adapting existing plans to account for new needs such as social distancing, facility closures and economic downturn. To that end, we have adapted the Interagency Heat Emergency Plan to prioritize the health and safety of all New Yorkers. This adapted plan builds on assumptions that social distancing guidelines in some form will still be in place during the summer months. The populations most at risk for heat-related illness, those with chronic conditions such as renal or heart disease, obesity or diabetes, severe mental illness or substance abuse has not changed. Unfortunately, these are largely the same populations at the greatest risk for complications from COVID-19. We have three pillars to our adapted heat emergency plan. These are 
more strategies to keep the most vulnerable cool and healthy without leaving their homes to visit a cooling center, new strategies to help cool a population without air conditioning who are at lower risk of COVID-19 but can safely travel outside their home, and adapted strategies to mitigate potential power outage, outages or load issues. Existing federal programs that help low-income vulnerable New Yorkers get cooling assistance reach less than 1,000 city residents every year. This summer, the city created a $55 million program to provide 74,000 air conditioners to New Yorkers who are 60 years of age or older, have an income below 60% of the state median income, and do not have air conditioning at home. To reach this goal, multiple New York City agencies are conducting direct outreach to New Yorkers who meet the criteria, particularly to those who are already receiving city benefits. Due to air conditioning usage, energy bills are generally higher in the summer and many people with air conditioners choose not to use them because of cost concerns. The city petitioned the Public Service Commission for the summer utility bill assistance for 450,000 low income New Yorkers so they can afford to run their air conditioners and keep cool indoors this summer. If the Public Service Commission will not cover this, the city will look to utilize federal funding or city funding to help bridge this gap. Additionally, the city is looking to expand the Home Energy Assistance Program or HEAP. This program typically allocated to assist with winter heating costs is a federal program that helps low-income households pay for heating or cooling their homes. Through the CARES Act, the federal government allocated an additional $900 million in HEAP funding nationwide. The city, through the Department of Social Services, is advocating that the state expand the use of its HEAP funds to start providing summer utility assistance in addition to providing more air conditioners to New York City residents. We have also adapted our heat emergency plan for traditional cooling options for those who can leave their homes. Assuming that senior centers, traditionally used at cooling centers, have not reopened, we have identified existing facilities that allow for social distancing and can be used as cooling centers in communities that are highly vulnerable for heat illness, communities of color, and immigrant communities. For example, we are working with the Department of Education to explore targeting schools with air conditioned classrooms that would allow for vulnerable New Yorkers to stay cool and isolated. We are also looking at transportation options to assist people in getting to these cooling facilities. During a heat event, people who normally rely on pools or beaches will flock to other water-based amenities like hydrant spray caps and spray showers in parks. The Parks Department and the Department of Environmental Protection will provide spray caps and spray showers in the parks and schedule hydrant openings to ensure access to outdoor cooling across the city while minimizing strain on the water system and also while maintaining necessary social distancing according to current COVID-19 prevention guidance. DEP will also create a reusable water bottle distribution program and a social media campaign beginning in June to promote reusable bottles and remind New Yorkers to stay hydrated. Similar to the issues presented with congregate cooling in a COVID-19 world, the city is modifying how it will respond to power disruptions this summer. Even before COVID-19, following last summer's blackouts, the city increased its coordination with our utility providers. This included monthly workshops, updates to our communication procedures, and a deeper understanding of the power grid. With COVID-19, we have doubled down on our engagement with our utility providers. Our teams are on multiple weekly calls with various planning efforts, including communications procedures and response protocols, and we are in the process of holding preseason trainings and briefings for all city agencies. New York City Emergency Management and Con Edison have lowered the threshold for notifications to agencies to prepare for these outages. In addition to these actions, in conjunction with utility providers, the city plans on pre-staging and rapidly mobilizing emergency generators as needed as well. As noted earlier, the same populations most at risk for heat illness are the most at risk for COVID-19 complications. As such, we have identified facilities that house these vulnerable populations, including isolation hotel sites, adult care facilities, nursing homes, and NYCHA buildings. 
The city has done initial power surveys at the hotels currently being used for COVID-19 and is prepared to deploy and install emergency generators in the event of a prolonged power outage to re-energize these buildings and reduce the need for evacuation of vulnerable residents. Recognizing that a significant number of air conditioners will be installed in NYCHA buildings, the city and NYCHA worked closely with Con Edison to identify buildings that may require additional electrical capacity and required electrical work is happening now. The hotel sites are currently being assessed and we will stage generators nearby if needed. Nursing homes are state regulated and required to have backup power capabilities. We will communicate to all nursing homes information regarding preventative maintenance, fueling, and testing of their backup generators to ensure that they are prepared for summer. Adult care facilities are also regulated by the state, but they are not required to have backup generation, and the majority do not. The city's centrally placed generators will be ready for quick rollout if emergency situations arise. We have advocated that the state mandate these facilities to be required to have either backup generation or a quick connect that will make emergency generation generator installation easier in the future and will continue to advocate for this. We are also reviewing pre-considered introduction T2020-6198, which would enact legislation requiring New York City Emergency Management and the Health Department to provide the city's cooling plan to the city council each year. Each year looks slightly different, obviously never more so than this year. We do a significant amount of public outreach and communication each year along the lines of the legislation and look forward to working with the council on this proposal. The administration is also reviewing pre-considered introduction T2020-6197, which would require the health department to report on heat vulnerability and heat reported deaths. The health department is a national leader in conducting health heat health research and providing data through its environment, environment and health data portal and looks forward to working with the council on this proposal. As Mayor de Plasio has stated, this is going to be a different summer than any summer we have seen before. We have to be ready. We have been getting ready and we will be ready. We are engaging with our partners at all levels of government to adapt our heat emergency plan to meet the moment. While while much remains uncertain about the moment we are in and what future moments will look like, this, as this summer goes on, our mission remains steady and focused. We are planning for and ready to respond to the challenges the summer months will present and will continue to support our city residents. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions and I'll turn it over now to Director Janie Babishi. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Belkis Meherig. I'll be moderating the remainder of this hearing. I'm the counsel to the Consumer Affairs Committee. Uh, Director Bavishi, if you'd like to begin your testimony, you may begin now. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chair Cohen of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, Chair Brannon of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, Chair Levine of the Committee on Health and Chair Constantinidis of the Committee on Environmental Protection for the opportunity to testify here today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague Commissioner Criswell from the New York City Office of Emergency Management and Assistant Commissioner Carolyn Olson from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as my own colleagues from my team in the Mayor's Office, uh, Deputy Director Suzanne DeRoach and Deputy Director Kizzy Charles Guzman. Climate change is a severe and growing threat. Rising temperatures driven by global warming threaten the health and sa safety of New Yorkers and particularly older adults, those without access to air conditioning and those with a variety of health, uh, health conditions. As you know, New York City is vulnerable to a phenomenon known as the urban heat island effect, which can make urban areas up to 22 degrees hotter than surrounding areas. In an average year, extreme heat kills approximately 130 New Yorkers, making it our most deadly climate hazard. To address the threat of extreme heat, in 2017, Mayor de Blasio launched Cool Neighborhoods NYC, an innovative strategic citywide effort to tackle extreme heat and its cascading impacts with many agency and nonprofit partners over the long term. These efforts reflect our commitment to managing future risks and provide the foundation for our current adaptive response to extreme heat this summer. 
The $106 million investment and comprehensive approach outlined in Cool Neighborhoods NYC expanded the administration's aggressive climate resiliency agenda to make neighborhoods cooler through significant tree planting in city streets and parks and painting reflective coatings on millions of square feet of rooftops in our most heat vulnerable neighborhoods. Together with the health department, we have also worked to protect the most vulnerable New Yorkers inside their homes by providing heat risk education and increasing social support networks through our Be A Buddy pilot program and enlisting home care agencies and community health organizations as partners in building community resiliency. These investments and strategies are targeted at the city's most heat vulnerable communities. The health department in Columbia University developed a pioneering heat vulnerability index that maps both physical and social vulnerability to precisely identify the neighborhoods at the highest risk. And this is the basis for the Mayor's Office of Resiliency's Cool Neighborhoods NYC strategy. With the COVID-19 pandemic impacting every part of our lives, this summer is shaping up to be unlike any other in history. As the summertime heat season approaches, the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis are poised to interact in ways that could cause additional loss of life, and in particularly in many low-income black and brown communities that have already been devastated by the virus. With stay at home and social distancing orders in place and more limited access to cool public spaces due to safety concerns, our administration has taken extra steps to ensure that New Yorkers can stay cool this summer. It's simply a matter of life and death. As Commissioner Criswell mentioned, two weeks ago, we were proud to announce the new $55 million program to provide an additional 74,000 Energy Star air conditioners to low-income seniors administered through our capable partners. We are particularly glad that this effort is designed with equity at its core by focusing on public housing residents and those who are most economically and phys physically vulnerable to heat-related illness and death. Our efforts to pr protect at-risk New Yorkers from heat this summer are unprecedented but there's even more that should be done, particularly at the state level. Expanding cooling assistance through the New York State HEAT Program or Home Energy Assistance Program and providing summer utility bill assistance through the Public Service Commission are two critical steps that should be undertaken without delay. Extreme heat is a significant threat to our most vulnerable communities and COVID-19 is demonstrating how multiple risks can compound this threat unequally in the city. We're glad to support significant progress on long-standing priorities that address New York City's most deadly climate threat now and in the future. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, the Committee on Environmental Protection, the Committee on Health, and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for allowing me to testify here today. My colleagues and I are now happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Director Bafishi. I'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen, followed by Chair Brannon and Chair Levine in that order. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council members other than the chairs would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in that order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time taken to answer questions. Thank you. Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, you know, it's funny, Commissioner, I don't think we've ever met. So it's uh, nice to meet you virtually and uh, Director I also, I'm not sure that we've ever met either. So uh, uh, I guess the, the overlap of the committees is uh, introducing me to new members of the administration, I don't know. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just gonna focus a little bit on uh, the coordination between the city of New York and Con Ed. Um, I, I, I would think that the, the relationship between uh, both OEM and resiliency is uh, integral to the work. Could you talk about that relationship, how it works, how, how you communicate? Uh, yes, uh, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues as well. And again, after the uh, events of last year, both in Manhattan as well in the Flatbush Network, uh, we worked closely with Con Edison to increase and improve our coordination efforts. Uh, so we have developed new protocols. Uh, we have lowered the threshold for communication. We participate regularly in both their exercises that they sponsor, as well as the exercises that emergency management facilitate. And we have been uh, involved in more than once weekly meetings now as we go into the summer months to make sure that we continue that coordination and we're sharing the information necessary as we prepare for this new COVID-19 related response that we are going to see ourselves in. 
I think one of the biggest lessons I learned last year was really having a better understanding of how quickly things can escalate and understanding what those triggers might be. And so one of the things that we have done on the emergency management side in coordination with um, resiliency as well as the Mayor's Office of Sustainability is to generate a communications protocol. So we are asking the right questions and we can escalate our response as well um, more quickly than perhaps we did before. Um, additionally, we've always been part of their CERC uh, when they activate that and we send representatives there as well as we have representatives that come here when we activate our emergency operations center. Uh, we are also going to start having a representative involved when they activate when Con Edison activates their situation room, which we did not do last year. While that may be virtually um, done this year, we are also going to be participating in a number of exercises uh, early June to make sure that we understand how we're gonna be able to coordinate in this new virtual world as we are still experiencing some social distancing um, guidelines. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Janie or Susan DeRoach for any additional comments they might have. Great, thank you, Commissioner Griswold. Um, I'll just add that we have are now doing a lot more coordination on the state level as well. So these weekly calls uh, that we have set up will they do include the Department of Public Service, their emergency operations uh, point person, so that we ensure that the regulator is part of those conversations with us um, as we head into the summer. We're also attending weekly meetings at the state level with the New York system, uh, independent system operator, NISO, who you heard Connison talk about, um, so that we can understand how the power generators are um, headed into this summer uh, with the COVID uh, response at the generation facilities themselves. Director, anything? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, what, what do you think in terms of the role of communicating uh, with the public? I, I, I think that uh, Con Ed was candid and that there were some challenges and also just the, the, the speed at which, uh, as you both made reference to, uh, things can get to go from okay to not so okay. Um, but in terms of communicating with the public, ultimately, I mean, the city, you know, is it the city's responsibility? Is it Con Ed's responsibility? How do you divvy up that or how do you how are those roles defined? Well you bring up a really important point and that communication both um, with each other as well as then out to the public is critical in making sure that our most vulnerable populations are going to have the time necessary to prepare and even more so as we go into this year. Um, I think it's a joint responsibility because at the same time, we also want to make sure we're giving out a consistent message and that anything that Con Ed might say is something that the city is saying as well. Uh, our external affairs office works very closely with, um, with all of the, the um, council members offices to make sure we're getting messages out there. We also have our Notify NYC where we try to get messages out to everybody as quickly as possible. This is also done in over 10 different languages. And it's really important that as we get information that is actionable, that the public can actually take steps to help protect themselves and put themselves in a better position, that we do get that out in coordination with Con Edison as quickly as possible. I just said, maybe I just trying to drill down a little deeper in, in terms of the coordination, how does that work? I and mean, is there a primary in communicating with the public? Is there a primary source, a secondary source? So the primary source from the city standpoint would be the Office of Emergency Management or New York City Emergency Management in coordination with the Mayor's Office of Communications. Uh, so we would use all of the mechanisms that we have available to get those emergency messages out um, in a timely manner um, to make sure we're giving them actionable information. So New York City Emergency Management takes the lead role, coordinates very closely with the Mayor's Office of Communications. And then, you know, there's a, a lot of different mechanisms to get information out. And so we really look on all of our different partners to help us amplify those messages as much as possible so we can reach as many people as possible. Uh, let me ask you this. What is uh, your, you heard Con Ed testify this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, they're predicting slightly lower usage uh, this summer. Actually, I guess it kind of significantly less usage this summer. Um, do you agree with that assessment? Do you think that Con Ed, uh, you know, are we going to see uh, blackouts this summer? 
what's you know <laughs> what do you predict is going to happen well, I'm, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I am cautiously optimistic with the uh, the predictions that Con Edison has stated. I think that the one thing that is important as we go forward is that we are going to have these weekly meetings with Con Edison. And the way I and my team are approaching this is looking at, you know, what has happened over the last week? How is that impacting what their models are? and just being very proactive and looking at these four different models that they had talked about to see if there's anything that we need to be concerned about ahead of time. So uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting year. We're all going into something that we have not encountered before. And I think this proactive look and predictive and analytics of what we think is happening to the electric grid is going to be really important to our response. I don't know, Suzanne, if you have anything additional about, about the um, impacts you think the summer will hold. Oh, she might be muted. Oh, there we go. Okay. No, I, I think that that's right. You know, I, I think these this uh, increased level of communication, both uh, with Con Edison and at the state level, will really help us uh, know if there are specific networks uh, in the system that may be uh, having, you know, having a higher uh, demand than we think today. But um, you know, having that weekly coordination uh, and working with the state is an important way for us to get ahead of any issues that they may see coming. I think the last thing that I'll just add for you on this is that we will always plan for the worst. That's my role as an emergency manager and it's planning for those things that we don't wanna to have to respond to and making sure we have the resources and the personnel in place to, to react as needed. Commissioner, what is the threshold by which Con Ed will notify you that there's an issue? I mean. If there's, you know, a wire down and, uh, ha you know, a block loses power or like, wh where's the threshold in which they're, they're telling you something is going on? So we've reduced the threshold as far as the feeder outages uh, that Con Edison mentioned before. And depending on the, the location of the outage, it could have been either two feeders out or three. And now it's, even if there's a single feeder out, they're going to notify us. So we have much increased notification of when they're having difficulty. So we can start to monitor and actually, you know, look at this cascading impact as they talked about of how quickly it might go to a two feeder outage or a three feeder into a four, four feeder. That way we know how quickly things might be progressing or deteriorating um, so we can react appropriately. What about in communities like I represent where that have significant overhead wires? What is the, what level of communication do you have regarding outages in those kinds of cases? Anytime there's an outage as a result from a storm or a vehicle that might hit a pole or something like that, we get that notification immediately. Uh, I suspect a lot of my colleagues have questions about the uh, air conditioning program and I'm going to defer to them. I will say, you know, for myself, and I, I suspect I speak for a lot of my colleagues uh, in terms of heap expansion and work with the Utilities uh, Commission, uh, you know, you can count on our support. If there's something we can do to communicate, uh, that would be, be helpful to let us know. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Brandon. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I guess I'm not sure if for uh, the commissioner or for, for Janie, um, as far as the, um, the air conditioner plan, um, are you confident with, with Con Ed being able to handle this? So uh, I'll start and then I think what, where we're at right now is that, you know, we have provided Con Edison a list of or general areas where we anticipate that we're going to be putting in air conditioners. And as we begin to install, we will be providing exact locations so they can evaluate the assessment that it's going to have or the impact that it's going to have on those networks where they're at. As far as whether their networks will be able to withstand that, Suzanne, do you have any comments on that? 
So given the information we've been able to provide them so far, uh, they have told us that they don't see an issue with the number of air conditioners and the load that those air conditioners uh, will add to those networks. Um, again, when we get to the point where we can look at a block basis, so you know it, when they can get down to that granular level of data, uh, they'll they'll look to what they can um, do within you know those localized parts of the network. But currently they have told us that they don't see an issue at the network level. Okay, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to stick, I'm trying to stick together on this. I mean, a lot of what I'm hearing from Con Ed sounds very paradoxical. I mean, I, I don't, you know, we're concerned, I think we're all concerned about more people staying inside um, more people running their air conditioners to stay cool. This plan that, that I, I was a champion and pushed for that, that you guys are doing, which I think is great. But then Con Ed is coming and telling us, actually, they expect power to be lower. I don't see, where are people going? I mean, how is that possible? I don't understand. Um, and I'm worried that they're preparing for lower usage when everyone else is, is concerned for the opposite. Well, I think your concerns are very valid. And I, the part that, that we're doing to make sure that we can monitor this is those, those weekly meetings so we can assess where they're at on a week by week basis. Uh, we'll also be able to monitor where we've put these air conditioners and look at those networks specifically to see if we're seeing increased load there or problems arising. And so all of this information and this data that we have is going to be critical to be um, in communication with them and monitoring again proactively how is the network responding to the increased usage even in as we approach these somewhat warmer days but not necessarily the hottest days right june is going to be a very telling month that that can help us get prepared and have a better idea of how we think it's going to respond before we get into the really hottest time of the summer in July and August. So again, I'm cautiously optimistic on their predictions. Um, trust but verify. That's why we're gonna we're gonna work with them weekly to monitor this very closely and stay in communication and be proactive to take any actions that we might need to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm certainly not an engineer, and I think everybody on the Zoom is, is, is admittedly smarter than I am about this stuff. But I know anecdotally, um, you know, we have issues in our districts um, on a regular summer when people are on vacation. Um, that's not happening this year. And Con Ed is basically telling us, these aren't the droids you're looking for, everything is fine. Um, and it's it's a concern because, you know, now on May 26, we're talking about what we're talking about two months from now in the middle of July, in the middle of a heat wave, you know, Con Ed telling the city that, they you know, they're going to, everything's going to be fine. And then it's not, you know, us doing a, another oversight hearing in the fall, talking about the disaster that was the summer of 2020 is that it's not what any of us wants, right? Like, I don't want to be there. I just want to prepare so that we don't have to, you know, uh, we don't have to, to, to have that hearing again. You know, I, I want to prepare now uh, before that happens. So I rely on, you know, we rely on you guys um, to make sure uh, that, that what they're saying is, you know, is legit. And, you know, and if you do have concerns that I hope we would address those concerns now while we're, we're looking, you know, we, while we still have time. You know, um, is there anyone who can speak to to some of the costs of the um, of the uh, air conditioner program? Is there something specific on the cost that you're looking at? So I, I just wanted to get a general breakdown. I mean, it's fifty five million dollars for 74,000 air conditioners to procure mm -hmm. and install. Basic back of the envelope math comes out to seven hundred and forty three dollars a unit. Most people hear that and their heads explode because they know they can go to PC Richards and buy an AC for 200 bucks. I understand we're not sending an intern to PC Richards with an ATM card to buy air conditioners, but I guess two things, the, the, what that cost comes out to, if it's, if, you know, right now the simple math is 743 bucks per unit, which seems a little crazy, even if it includes installation. But number two, 
is any or all of this reimbursable by FEMA? And is that part of the, um, you know, the math here? So, you, so your back of the napkin math is accurate as kind of the estimate going into that. And again, these are all estimates based on, again, uh, supply, different vendors that we're going to be using, uh, installation costs, uh, overtime costs, because we want to be working more than an eight hour day, as well as seven days a week, right? So there's additional costs that will be coming from working with these different vendors to make sure that we can meet our deadline of having these installed by July 1st. Uh, as far as reimbursable by FEMA, this, you know, we are certainly going to try and uh, submit for reimbursement for anything that's eligible, whether it's through uh, the FEMA funding or any of the CARES Act funding that's out there. Uh, certainly one of the things that we took into consideration on what might or might not be eligible, and we will be reaching out to the federal government to see if we can get any of this reimbursed. Okay, but that wasn't, but, but the, the amount of air conditioners and, and the money that we allocated here um, was not, we're not sort of backing into something, right? We're, we're going to petition to try to get the reimbursement, but we didn't dictate the program based on what was available. Correct. If I'm understanding you correctly, we are going to go forward with this program, not contingent on it being federally reimbursable. We are going to try to make to see if we can get any of this reimbursed through the federal government. Uh, but that wasn't a limiting factor. We want to be able to uh, save lives this summer and be able to support New Yorkers. And so uh, the city has committed to moving forward to this program, but we will look for reimbursement as as costs are eligible. So, all right. So basically, if we so we're basically we've set aside a, this certain amount of money, but there there is a, a possibility or potential that will actually end up costing less. Costing, I, I, there's always a possibility that it may cost less, right? These were just estimates as we were going into it, and then again, there's always the possibility that some of this will be reimbursable. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to talk about hurricane season a little bit. Um, 2020 hurricane season, I think we've mentioned it before during this hearing, predicted to be more active than usual. Um, the, first, the first storm, tropical storm Arthur has already developed off the coast of Florida. That's before June 1st, which is the official start of hurricane season. What preparations are in place if we get hit by a storm this summer, considering social distancing will still be in place? Um, that's one. And then as far as any types of these, these situations, whether it's a cooling center or, um, you know, a shelter for, for hurricanes, um, how are we thinking outside the box to, to figure out how you get a, what's usually a whole bunch of people in a school auditorium, which, which wouldn't be possible with social distancing? Great questions and something that we have been looking at since the COVID-19 crisis hit us uh, earlier in March and we developed the Cascading Impacts Team to look at a number of our plans that uh, could potentially impact us in the immediate future as well as going into the summer months. So for example, a normal vacate order where we would put uh, individuals in shelters, we adapted that plan in the very early days of this to make sure that we could accommodate um, shelters through hotels if we needed to vacate a building. Uh, in that line, we then started to look very closely at heat because that was gonna be our next most um, significant threat that we would face the soonest, and we have been actively looking at our coastal storm planning as well. The city has 12 different plans that affect various parts of coastal storm planning from evacuations to shelters to healthcare evacuations. And we have a full team that is looking at those and very similarly to what we have done with our heat adaptation planning, we are also adapting those plans to make sure we can address and accommodate those things that you talked about as far as how do we accommodate uh, individuals that need to evacuate but still make sure that we can keep people safe through social distancing. Uh, these are a lot of, there are a lot of questions out there. We do not have all of the coastal storm plans adapted yet. Um, we are happy to engage with you again later this summer or earlier this summer to talk through our coastal storm efforts, but it is definitely a piece that is uh, actively being um, analyzed and updated right now. And as far as cooling centers, are, are we gonna, I assume we're gonna have to increase them to allow for more space, right? So I wouldn't say increase the number of cooling centers. We're definitely gonna have a different approach for 
for cooling centers this year. And unlike last year, where we would have a large number of cooling centers that we would announce, and I think last year it was somewhere around 500, our focus this year is trying to protect those that are the most vulnerable. And so we're gonna have a very targeted um, approach to how we open cooling centers. Looking at our traditional cooling center sites right now, we only have about 80 that can be used and we're in the process of looking at how many people can be accommodated in each of those safely. Uh, we have to work very closely with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene because there are certain guidelines for when and when we cannot use cooling centers, but we are certainly putting plans in place um, that we can perhaps use them for those that are um, considered to be safe to leave their homes. We're also going to look at other very targeted areas to be able to um, add to the number of cooling centers in the areas that have been identified as the most vulnerable for heat. And so we want to be very specific and very targeted into the populations that we think will need them the most and make sure we can provide them the cooling that's needed. As far as the general population, then we're looking at other non-traditional ways that we can support cooling efforts and that's through increased use of hydrant spray caps, the Parks Department is going to be using spray showers um, and definitely making sure that we can still utilize those tools in a way that, again, keeps people safe, effectively socially distanced, making sure that we have the proper face coverings available for all personnel. Okay. Um, okay, I'll give it back to Chair Cohen to give, give my colleagues some time to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that Council Member Levine has some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Cohen. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner and Director. Um, I'm trying to understand how you've projected that we'll have lower demand for heating uh, for cooling centers this summer. I mean, normally people can seek refuge in uh, a cafe or a restaurant or a movie theater or a store or probably even more commonly the home of a friend, neighbor, or family member who has air conditioning. And a lot of those public establishments are not gonna be open. And because of social distancing concerns, we don't want um, people combining households like that. So it seems to me that the, the demand is greater. Um, and, and, and by the way, uh, traditional senior center infrastructure is also not going to be up and running. So, so explain to me why you don't think we'll have greater demand this summer. Yeah, and let me just uh, correct myself. It's not that I said that we're going to have a lower demand. There's definitely going to still be a demand there, but because our options are limited, we're going to make the best use of the available resources we have to target the most vulnerable populations. And so the demand is definitely still going to be there. We just wanna make sure we're taking care of those that are the most risk for heat as well as for COVID-19 and provide them safe solutions to keep them cool during the hottest part of the day. Uh, we're working with other, again, with the parks department and other areas to think about how the general population can perhaps find other ways, non-traditional ways or outdoor mechanisms to stay cool. Uh, again, the demand is not less, the demand will be more, um, but with limited resources available and the limited amount of cooling center options, we need to target that to those that are the most vulnerable. The first step in that though is providing that in-home cooling assistance. And that is gonna be the number one way that we can protect those that are most vulnerable is providing in-home cooling uh, to the greatest extent possible. And that, that definitely could make up for the lack of options outside of the home. Um, and I, I do want to ask about that in a moment, but just to stay on the cooling center question. So you mentioned that normally we have about 500. Uh, understandably, some are, are pretty small and that you have identified 80 where there's enough room for adequate social distancing. So uh, that leaves a pretty big gap, uh, even if we do deploy a lot of home air conditioners, considering the other factors I just mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. How, how far along are you on identifying ways to make up that gap, but larger facilities where we can really spread people out? There's definitely a gap. And again, we've identified 80 of our traditional cooling sites that we know we can use, but we're also still looking at our traditional cooling sites that perhaps are closed 
in trying to figure out the best way or what the lead time might be that we could open them up in a timely fashion to still utilize them as a cooling center. So can we open up our libraries and what would it take to open up those types of cooling center sites that we traditionally use? Again, we're working with the Department of Education to see what we can um, use to support. For me, we're really looking at how can we use them to target um, and put in place non-congregate type settings for our most vulnerable, those that don't get air conditioners and we can keep them separated in classrooms. And then we're working really closely with uh, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency to identify some non-traditional sites, um, but we're targeting, again, those areas of the greatest heat vulnerability, and we want to see where our current gaps are, and then we will reach out to them to see if there's any other um, resources that we can put an agreement in place or a lease in place with. Uh, my team has been working on cooling center strategies. They have a plan that's due to me by the end of this week. And so we can see what the next steps are to put those either memorandums of agreement or lease agreements in place to expand that capability. Okay, there's been some reports that you're considering um, some really out of the box ideas like arenas where you would have enough space to allow people to spread out in big numbers and where the cooling infrastructure is good. Can you speak to that? Are you, are you looking at using those structures which are otherwise totally empty and may really may be a, a, a good solution here? Yeah, we're looking at a number of different sites that could be possibilities. And again, our goal though is to really focus on those areas of most vulnerable and where are our gaps. And so we're looking at a number of different potential sites. Anything is on the table. Um, if we can negotiate a good memorandum of agreement or a lease agreement to utilize them, depending on what may or may not be open as we go through the summer. Uh, I don't know, Janie, if you have, I know your team has been working a little bit on that, um, but again, really trying to figure out what our gaps are first before we decide which ones we need and which ones we're gonna negotiate with. That's right. We're, we're looking to see which uh, what kinds of facilities might be viable for the summer. We've reached out, for example, to the um, VOED organizations, volunteer organizations active in disasters, um, just to reach a network of facilities that uh, otherwise uh, wouldn't necessarily be used as cooling centers to see which ones can be activated. So we're looking um, at uh, various networks of facilities. Um, and as Commissioner Criswell said, we're really uh, working to make sure that um, we're serving the, the most at-risk areas as we identify which uh, facilities uh, might be viable. Okay, I appreciate that. Moving on to the question of the air conditioners, and uh, it, is, it is really uh, important and, and welcome that the city is moving to distribute these units. I do want to understand the scale of the need, and I wonder whether you've analyzed um, how many low-income households there are who don't have air conditioning currently. I know you're focusing just on those over 60, which clearly are the most vulnerable, but um, I guess I'll start with the big question. How many households in New York City lack air conditioning? Uh, at the process that we use to come up with the number, I'll turn that back over to uh, Director Bavishi to answer. Sure. Um, yeah, we use the uh, HPD housing vacancy survey um, as a basis to estimate the New Yorkers that are most vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, and we also use health-based criteria uh, for heat-related illness and death, focusing on residents uh, who are 60 years old, over 60 years old, as you mentioned, and um, have income below 60 percent of the state median income um, and do not have air conditioning at home. And then additionally, we accounted for seniors in NYCHA who rely on electronic medical equipment or have mobility issues that might uh, make it difficult for them to attend cooling centers when and if they're available. Um, so our goal here was to really identify and focus on the population that are both vulnerable to extreme heat, but are also at serious risk um, of COVID-19 illness. Um, and we're uh, working hard to deliver these AC units as quickly as possible to those households. And, and that's, that was the 72,000 number? 74,000. Met those criteria? Yes, the number is 74,000. Right. We have to prioritize the most vulnerable, but there's a public health interest in ensuring that everybody at every age can avoid having to go somewhere where it's crowded to seek relief from the heat. And 
if someone who's 50 or 40 or 30 uh, has to go to the home of a neighbor or family member, which is crowded, um, that could accelerate the spread of the virus, even if that individual is not themselves uh, a senior. Um, there really is a public health interest in, in avoiding that. And uh, I think we need to, I think we need to expand the program to address that. Uh, if, if we believe that FEMA is, is largely reimbursing, why not extend this to any low income family? Um, perhaps prioritizing a supply is limited those with a senior in the household, but uh, why not go big and, and meet the need uh, for every low income household to prevent the kind of overcrowding I described? It's a really valid point, and with a, a, a very limited, you know, supply of air conditioners that are out there and the time frame that we're looking at, we really wanted to focus our efforts on reaching those that are the most vulnerable. Again, those that are at the highest risk for heat-related illnesses, as well as those that are at the highest risk for COVID-19-related illnesses. Uh, we are certainly open to perhaps expanding as we meet that need, but that's really our focus right now. And again, looking at a very short period of time, trying to get 74,000 installed by July 1, that's we wanted to do the most good for those that are the most vulnerable. Right. Um, I just add to what Commissioner Criswell said that this is why we're taking a multi-layered approach and also working to identify cooling centers and other, other outdoor cooling options um, that we can operate safely this summer in the context of social distancing. Um, so we're also, uh, our, our teams are um, very focused on that at the moment and we'll have um, more to talk about very soon. Right. And I, I do want to move on to uh, a couple of logistical questions about the program, but I think we can all agree that we've gotten lucky with the weather in the last two months. It's been unseasonably cool and wet. And it's meant that most people, at least from a, from a heat perspective, have been comfortable in their apartments. And that's about to change. Mm -hmm. And that could really have a big impact on social distancing, both indoors and outdoors. And the amount of money that it would cost to install air conditionings uh, is, is quite minor compared to the cost in financial and human terms of a second uh, peak in coronavirus. So I really do think it warrants the investment, even if FEMA doesn't reimburse. But I, I do just wanna ask about the process. So um, at what point do you think you'll start to uh, deliver and install the first air conditioners? Uh, Commissioner Gazal, okay. I'll take this. Or would you like to? Um, I'll start and then I can turn it over to you, Janie. So, uh, so we have started um, outreach already. Uh, NYCHA has been doing outreach as well as um, DSS and HPD will be doing outreach and H um, DSS, NYCHA and uh, DIFTA are doing outreach to their most vulnerable clients. Uh, we do have two vendors that are already on contract, uh, Clearview and AJ Madison. Clearview has been installing air conditioners uh, for the few days going into the long weekend. I mean, we expect to see a, um, an increase in the number of air conditioners be installed starting today and through the week. Um, our goal again is to try to get all 74,000 installed by July 1st. And so it starts with the, the outreach piece of it. Then we will schedule with the uh, those that opt in and want to uh, receive an air conditioner. And then we will give that list to the vendors who will then install. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Janie? No, I think you covered it. So I was confused. There was installation over the weekend? Uh, right the before the weekend. So so we installed a few, uh, two air conditioners into NYCHA buildings, I think on Thursday or Friday of last week. Uh, there was a little bit of slowdown over the weekend as far as outreach and installation because of the long weekend, but it is starting back up uh, this week and we have 591 uh, households that have already identified that they would like one and they will be installed this week. Okay. Still right. a long way to go to get to 73,000. It seems like, I mean, you, you did two uh, last week, so yeah. uh, 73,998 to go. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I mean, that's, uh, that's like 20,000 a week or something like that to hit your target, um, 15 to 20,000. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, know, you talk about 500 this week, that, that's also 
way below the pace. That's going to mean for the following three weeks, uh, you know, you may have to be over 20,000 a week. Uh, are you going to be able to meet that target? So I, we are going to definitely be able to meet that target. It's definitely a slow start trying to get everybody on board, uh, information sharing, data gathering, um, and we are bringing on additional vendors to support this installation effort, as well as city employees and support from the National Guard that's going to help us do the outreach calls. So with a slow start, understood, but we are going to meet that as we bring on additional vendors to both provide uh, air conditioners as well as install. And finally, if, if you could just explain enrollment or how someone opts in, it sounds like uh, for NYCHA families, NYCHA itself is, is playing a, a kind of a coordination role there. Um, and so then for families in private housing who need uh, a unit, is, is there uh, an application process established? How, how, how do individual families apply if they're not in NYCHA? So this is a direct outreach program through pre-identified populations um, in NYCHA, in DIFTA, through the DSS channels, as well as HPD. And so we are reaching out to them uh, on the information that we have received on who would be eligible for this program. And but that could leave someone who's over 60 and low income, who's not part of any of those programs, no? I think there's always the possibility that uh, we might not reach everybody. Uh, if there's somebody that, or if there's a population that you think is missed, you know, we can certainly reach out to your office or you can engage with, with our offices. Um, but right now it's a direct outreach program based on the data that we have. So right now you just have to wait until the city reaches out to you essentially. There's no way to apply. And if you're in one of those programs, presumably that'll happen soon, otherwise. There's no option. All of our outreach is scheduled to be completed by June 10th. And so we should have all of our populations out of those four, or all of our residents out of those four different populations should have received some type of communication by June 10th. Right, and if they're in one of those groups and they haven't heard by then, is there a way they can proactively enroll or someone they can reach out to? Um, at this point, it's still just a direct outreach, but let us get back to you and see uh, about somebody who is in one of those and has not been contacted. Uh, look, I, I, I'm going to wrap up. I understand that, that even the goal you've laid out now is ambitious considering the timeline. I don't want to minimize that, but it sure seems to me that we're leaving out some very needy families from this program and uh, that it's, it, it, it would simply be a smart investment to expand this, uh, I mean, most obviously to people who are who meet the age and income criteria but aren't in one of these programs, but I would say even further, um, people who are low income, families who are low income but don't have a senior in the household. I really do think this is a key pillar of keeping the city safe, simply from a public health perspective this summer. So um, thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. Look forward to working with uh, you, Commissioner, and, and also you, Director. And I'll pass it back to you, Chair Cohen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Balkis, I'm giving it back to you, I think, and you're going to call on members. Is Balkis there? Sorry, I was on mute. Oh, thank no you. Problem. I'll now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. You should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced begin before asking your questions. First, we'll hear from council member Rose followed by council member Lander. Council member Rose, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time starting now. Councilmember Rose. Am I unmuted now? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. I wanna thank the chairs for, um, for holding this really important uh, meeting. Um, and uh, my questions were about the cooling centers, uh, but my colleagues have you know, very thoroughly uh, 
sort of examined that, that topic. And I wanna thank Chair Levine for really drilling down on, um, on the cooling centers. But um, you stated that you've identified 80 locations that can be used um, for cooling centers from a total of 500 that was used last year. My question is, you know, what metrics are you using to determine how many people will need to access cooling centers? And do you think you're going to be able to accommodate that need? And um, more specifically, my concerns are with the fact that Staten Island, my district specifically, continues to be under, re excuse me, under resourced despite the administration's uh, commitment to, uh, to make sure that there's an equitable distribution of resources to the most vulnerable. And um, we have not gotten uh, the equitable distribution of resources in any of these uh, you know, initiatives or programs, starting with testing, PPEs, et cetera. So um, I, I really would like to know what metrics you're using to determine how many people um, are going to need cooling centers um, and how are you going to be able to accommodate that with having only identified 80 sites and um, and specifically how are my my constituents going to actually get the amount of resources that they need thank you uh, thank you, Councilmember Rose. So the, the number 80 that we have identified are 80 out of our traditional sites that we know are available to operate. There's going to be a number of factors that go into play on whether we can actually open them as well, right? And that's, you know, the public health guidance that's going to come from DOHMH on how to safely operate and what that would look like. As far as the metrics on how many we think we'll need, again, we're looking very closely at the heat vulnerability index, and I'll turn it over to Janie a little bit that can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we look at that and we're looking at those cooling centers, other traditional cooling centers that may fill in gaps that we can open up um, that are perhaps not on that list of 80 because they're currently closed, and then what it would take to open those up. And then we're also looking at census data, right? And so how many people went to different cooling centers last year in these most vulnerable areas to help us get an idea of the probable number that we might need. We're gonna see some changes in that as we go through the summer, right? Because we're gonna have some changes in that because we're providing air conditioners to some of our most vulnerable people. And that will also, once we have those identified and installed, will go into helping to further define or refine what the gap are you is. Going to in be able, are you gonna be able to, based on the metrics you're using, yeah. are you gonna be able to meet the need? So I need, to, what I, I need to identify what the need is. And then again, it's not gonna be the same. It's very much a different year this year. Uh, we're not going to be able to open all of the cooling centers that we normally would have opened. And our focus is going to be on those areas that are the most vulnerable, that have the highest need for cooling assistance. How are you going to determine who the most vulnerable are? I know that we have some sort of idea of what, how you identify them, but how are you going to make sure that the distribution among the most vulnerable is going to be equitable? It's a great question. And again, we use uh, the heat vulnerability index to help guide our planning decisions. And I'm going to turn it over to Janie um, if you have some additional information you can provide on why that index is so important for this planning process. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Olson from the Department of Health since the Department of Health helped to create that index. Okay. Great, you can, everybody can hear me? Good afternoon. Um, so our, our heat vulnerability index is a measure that was developed in collaboration with the uh, Columbia University in order to understand the variation in vulnerability to heat related death. Um, and it takes into account both environmental and social factors that determine- I've expired. So, sorry? I just want to know, are you going to be able to meet the needs based on your index? 
Are you going to be able to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people it, that will need cooling centers? That's that's really my my concern. And it's a valid concern. And we are going to do everything we can to open up additional cooling centers in those areas that we have identified as the most vulnerable. I need to know what my need is first and see where my gaps are. And then we will be doing whatever we can to find additional facilities that aren't normally used that we can add to it. And I think it's also important to highlight another piece of this overall strategy, which is utility assistance. Um, we mentioned it in our testimony, but we haven't really focused on it during the Q&A. Um, and Chair Cohen, you mentioned that you um, are willing to help support our work with the Public Service Commission and as well as our advocacy on the HEAP program. There's actually a deadline at 4.30 today. We have filed a petition to the Public Service Commission asking them to help uh, provide utility assistance to low-income families across the city. Um, um, this would go to about 450,000 families. Any support that the council can provide in, a, in the form of a letter to the Public Service Commission will only help to strengthen our case, but the deadline is at 4.30 p.m. today. Um, so we would really appreciate your support on that front. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. I'd now like to turn it over to Chair Cohen to acknowledge uh, Chair Consolidus. I'm uh, I'm unmuted now. Uh, I think Councilmember Rose had one more follow-up. Uh, so if we could throw it back to Councilmember Rose, and I will acknowledge that we have been joined by Chair Constantinides. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Chair Cohen. Um, I, yes, you do have my support on um, the the letter that's going out. Um, I I'm all for that. I just want to impress upon the commissioner that the most vulnerable exists in all of the five boroughs. And I wanna make sure that my most vulnerable are included in whatever metrics you come up with so that they too can have the resources that they need to, uh, this summer. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. I'd now like to turn it over to Councilmember Lander. Starting time. Thank you very much. Thanks to the chairs for this really important hearing. And uh, my questions actually follow well from the dialogue you had at the end with uh, Councilmember Rose. Um, I uh, learned an immense amount from Eric Kleinenberg's book, Heat Wave. Uh, which looked at the 1995 summer in Chicago when something like 700 uh, Chicagoans died from a heat wave for many of the reasons we're talking about. So I think it's really good that we are getting out in front and making sure that we, um, you know, do everything we can to get ready. And, you know, he found, as we're discussing here, that, you know, heat-related deaths and illnesses were disproportionately in African-American and, um, and low-income communities. So, I really appreciate the work you've done with Columbia to really target and think about how you get out in front of that. Another thing that he found though that I thought was really interesting was that um, one of the real factors was social isolation, not in that that was an independent factor of race and income that people, and it makes sense, that have more ties, have someone checking in on them and talking to them and, you know, and and that's good for getting an air conditioner and, and, and not dying of heat stroke. And, and it's good for not having all kinds of other health and mental health problems as well. And obviously that wasn't even in a pandemic where everyone is stuck inside their homes for the better part of a year. So I guess my question is a little less about the heat related side of this and a little more about what we're doing on the social isolation side. Um, I know that calls you know, are going from you know, senior serving organizations. I know a lot of volunteer groups are doing kind of one-time check-in calls. Um, in my office, we've stood up a thing that we're trying to expand and I'd be glad to talk to you guys about to enable recurring calls. So a volunteer doesn't just call once and say, do you have food and air conditioner, but says, would you like to talk once or twice a week for the duration of this crisis to sort of build social ties um, that help combat social isolation. And we've had good success with that, uh, working with Heights and Hills in, in, in our part of Brooklyn and are talking with some others about it. Um, but I, I guess I would like to tell you, if you could tell me a little more, and I know this was designed to be about heat and not about social isolation, but they go so much together here. 
Um, what can you tell me about what we're doing collectively? And this isn't just on the city. I mean, the city can do some things, but really doing this would mean tapping into the social relationships and volunteers, um, you know, a much on a much broader scale. Um, are we using this, you know, be a buddy program to build that more strongly? And what could we do together to really scale this up to the level of need, which obviously goes way beyond those. I mean, 74,000 is a lot of people to get air conditioners to, so I don't want to, but, but there are probably hundreds, there are hundreds of thousands uh, of vulnerable at risk uh, homebound seniors right now for whom the risks of social isolation as well as the risks of heat, you know, present real risk. It's a, it's a great question. I, I'm going to turn to Carrie from DOHMH on the social isolation. Is there anything that you can add to that or answer for that? Okay. Um, yes, thank you. So, um, so yes, I, I think it's a great point. I really appreciate you bringing it up. We do know from our research, um, not only from uh, Kleinenberg's amazing book, but also our research here in New York City, that social isolation is a very important factor and not just for heat, but also for a number of other health, um, health issues. Um, I can uh, follow up with more information about this, but I know apart from heat, the health department is actually doing wellness check calls um, to, to New Yorkers as part of our response related to COVID. And then I also wanna speak to our Be A Buddy program, which you mentioned, um, and which we do in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and is part of that Cool Neighborhoods program. So we have partnered with three amazing organizations um, in three of the neighborhoods that have the highest vulnerability to heat related um, health impacts and those organizations actually have done amazing work responding in this pandemic as well. So they're using that social infrastructure that's so important as part of our response to be both climate resilient and also resilient to other emergencies. And they're using that to reach out to community members and check in on them and also connect them to available resources. And so we'll be leaning on all of those different, um, those different pieces as well as a number of other amazing efforts that I know Commissioner Criswell and um, uh, Janie can also speak to. Okay, I'd love to talk, uh, uh, maybe follow up offline on this because I think this Pardon, tool, we were, we, we were surprised to learn that there wasn't a good tool for recurring calls to set somebody up in an ongoing relationship. And we've built a, a pretty good uh, tool for that and are having some good success with it. So I'd be interested in talking to you a little more. We could share the tool with others who might find it valuable. I think the opportunity to get even more volunteers, people are so desperate to help and some can go out and do emergency food service, but I think a lot of folks would be willing to join a much bigger team doing, you know, one time wellness checks great and also building some durable relationships that can, can help people weather this. So um, is that uh, with Ms. Olson, should I follow up with you? Yeah, we would definitely be interested in, in talking more about that. Thanks. Great. All right, thanks to the chairs for this valuable hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. I'll now be calling on Councilmember Barron to, to ask her questions. Starting time now. Okay, hit the right button. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank the chairs, Brannon, Cohen, Levine, and Constantinides. And I want to thank the administration for coming to participate in this hearing. The environmental justice bill, which is a part of local law 64, says that uh, they recognize that there has been historic racism in how communities of color, black and brown communities have been the site for uh, transfer stations and other negative impactful environmental projects that go on. And what they have said that these have resulted in high levels of asthma being uh, in those communities and that communities are suffering and have health concerns. So the bill says that there would be a working group of different agencies within the city that would be tasked with coming together to develop a plan. 
And those agencies were to include DEP, DOHMH, Planning, DOT, DSNY, Department of Buildings, and mm -hmm. others. And the intent was that communities would share equally in the benefit as well as the burdens of environmental justice issues. And the working group was supposed to have met, come up with plans, which they were then to bring forward so that they could be reviewed. The public would have an opportunity to comment on those issues and the plan would be finalized by December, 2021. So now I think that we're a little again behind in making appropriate arrangements for what we expected in a more general term to be issues that needed to be addressed and we have not moved forward. So I wanted to know, first of all, what is the administration's position on putting this working group into place, getting these meetings going, getting people to have input so that as we sit and hear what you plan to do and where you plan to put the centers, we don't again get stuck with the injustice and the inequity of uh, plans being put that do not benefit our community and in fact harm our community. We need to be involved in making these decisions, not you telling us where you plan to put them and we have to then react. We need to be on the ground at the planning stages to make sure that there is in fact the equity as we get the benefits because we certainly have more than our share of the burden. So where is the administration in this regard? Hey, Carrie, do you have an answer for this working group? We're not part of this. The Mayor's Office of Climate Policy and Programs um, oversees this working group. Um, no yeah. one from that office is uh, testifying here today, so we can follow up with you about the status of the working group. What I can say about our heat work, though, is that um, absolutely we uh, are we, the heat vulnerability index has taken both physical and social risk indicators into account in order to ensure that we are identifying who are the most vulnerable communities, not just from the physical indicators of risk, but also the social, including income and race. And um, we are working for the most part. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that part. Yes, they tend to travel together for the most part. And they're the black and brown and economically oppressed communities. That's right. And we're working to target our solutions um, so that the environmental benefits we're delivering from our resiliency approach, as well as the uh, uh, approaches that we're um, taking for this summer, which is such a unique situation, um, reach those exact communities. So um, we're absolutely um, uh, placing equity at the center of our approach. But um, to your question about the Environmental Justice Working Group, we'll get back to you on that. And when can I expect that we will have not only just when we'll get back, but when it will start functioning and when it will start doing what it is required by law to do. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, intimately familiar with that work just because it is run by a separate mayor's office, but I do believe uh, the working group has been stood up. Um, so uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll get back to you with a detailed uh, status. Thank you. I think it's critical that the communities that are most negatively impacted are involved in making the decisions about how these programs will roll out. Thank you very much. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. I'll now turn it over to the chairs for any additional questions. Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, uh, Director Bravashi, could you maybe email me or one of your team email me uh, maybe what you sent the commission so that I could uh, use that as a basis to draft something? Because if I want to do that before 4.30, uh, we've got to do it now. Absolutely, uh, so we'll, we'll pass along a draft letter. That would be great. Um, I do want to drill down a little bit on the, the cooling center situation. Um, something that we discovered on the ground, and you know, it's funny, one of the advantages that, that I think is sometimes as a council member we have is uh, because we're dealing with all different agencies all the time, uh, people who we did not know were food insecure or who might not have been food insecure pre-COVID turned out that once COVID hit, that they did face food insecurity. And I'm wondering if there might be a similar situation uh, brewing sort of about uh, access to cooling. Um, that, you know, I had people who were, did not go to a senior center who need, who for, for lunch, but turned out once COVID, they weren't able to shop for themselves anymore, needed, needed help getting food. Uh, so 
uh, I'm concerned that the, the that the matrix that you're using that relying on agencies that you know their their information is based on the norm and there are you know real significant changes taking place as we all know uh, so that we don't want to leave a huge swath of people out who might need access to cooling just because they're not sort of traditionally in need of cooling. Uh, have you thought about that? And uh, how do you think that the, what we have covers that? It's a great point. Again, I think it goes back to this is a unique summer and it's going to take a layered approach to make sure that we provide uh, solutions that can reach out to this newly vulnerable population. Uh, the air conditioning program is really targeted at those that are the most vulnerable because as we've um, seen that we want to, the best way to keep them safe and keep them cool is to keep them in their homes. Um, but there's there has to be the other options that we're putting out there. And so where do we need cooling centers and how can we safely operate those? Uh, the, as uh, Director Babashi pointed out, the assistance with their um, utility bills, um, reaching out to hopefully 450,000 individuals that maybe would have chosen to go to a cooling center in the past because they didn't want to use their air conditioner, but now maybe using their air conditioner. It's going to take this type of a layered approach to make sure that we provide resources to reach those vulnerable populations. And again, those populations are definitely going to be different this year than they were last year, just because of the environment that we find ourselves in now. I guess one, I'm concerned that our definition of most vulnerable is outdated because that definition sort of pre-COVID. I can envision a scenario where I could have a constituent who doesn't have an air conditioner in their apartment because they, they use a senior center normally and they just mm -hmm. never, you know, and even if they could afford an air conditioner, they might not be able to access one now. So they don't have access to the senior center and they don't have the ability, like they're not internet savvy, they can't go on to pcrichards.com and have somebody right. appear. That's a problem. And those people, you know, just like, you know, the tragedies that people found in their home, COVID, the last thing we want to do is that people found in their home because of heat. No, it's a fair point. And, you know, as we're getting this program up and running, I think it definitely it warrants some further analysis to see, you know, are we targeting everybody that we can? Um, we have data that shows where our most vulnerable populations are historically. We understand that there are newly vulnerable populations out there as well. Uh, we have a short period of time to really impact those that we know are going to need it the most. And, um, but your point is well taken and we'll certainly, you know, um, continue to look at how we can reach out to other populations um, if we're not quite hitting the mark with the current efforts that we have. I appreciate that. Uh, Chair Brennan, do you have anything else? Um, thank you, Chair. I wanted just to ask about um, the, the the my bill that's that's where we're hearing um, and um, according to the CDC, an average of thirteen average of thirteen city residents died each year from heat related illnesses between uh, two thousand and two thousand and eleven. Uh, however, some studies indicate that this number may be much lower than the actual number of heat related deaths because of how a hot day is, is currently defined. The city also reports an average of 115 excess heat related deaths, 150 heat related hospitalizations and 450 heat related emergency uh, ER visits every year. So uh, does the administration support this, this legislation? And do you agree that it's important to account for uh, deaths that are exacerbated by heat, which, you know, meaning a natural cause of death is, is natural only because it's resulting from an existing heat condition exacerbated by heat? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so yes, I, I want to start by saying we completely share your interest in making these data public and also recognizing that heat stroke or hyperthermia deaths um, where there's actually a, um, a cause of death on the death certificate that says heat are only the tip of the iceberg. And so actually the analyses that you're citing around the 115 additional excess deaths uh, were conducted by the health department. 
And we've done that because we want to make sure that we are understanding the full scope of the problem in our city, as well as tracking the other health indicators that you mentioned. Um, we make many of those available on our environment and health data portal. And we've also published these in um, reports and use them regularly in our outreach so that people can understand that heat's not just uncomfortable, but that it can truly be dangerous. Um, so we're very interested in continuing to, to discuss this and also talk with you about how the ongoing work that we've been doing for really more than a decade to really understand both the scope of heat related illness and death and also the inequities that we see and we've all been talking about here, how we can um, align those with your interest in, in a report and be even more transparent with our data. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, because, you know, one of the main things, obviously, that, that was really um, one of the, the main concerns and one of the main reasons for this hearing is, you know, the, the, the concern that the same communities that are, have been disproportionately devastated by COVID are also the ones that are most impacted by summer heat. I mean, are, is there an overall um, focus from the administration as far as anticipating a higher risk of heat related deaths or heat related issues um, through these vulnerable populations this year? And, and what's being done around that broadly? Yeah, so I'll start, but if that's all right. And, but I think that, that big picture, I think that's exactly what this whole conversation has been about. And I, I completely agree. So we do know that the individuals that are at greatest risk of severe COVID complications are in um, large part exactly the same individuals that we know are at greatest risk of heat related illness and death if they don't have an air conditioner in, our, in their homes. And our research has really shown that, um, and, and I think you actually, um, you actually in your opening remarks um, mentioned the fact that the vast majority of heat deaths that occur in New York City occur in homes where there is um, no working air conditioner. And so the exposure that is that people are experiencing is happening in their homes, which is exactly why the um, unprecedented program that the, that the city is putting together now in order to address in-home cooling assistance is so important and is going to save so many lives. Um, we don't know exactly what the summer will bring. Um, that depends on the weather. But we do know that with COVID prevention um, uh, measures in place and all of the things that we've been talking about, about needing people to stay home in order to reduce their risk of um, contracting COVID, especially for those highest risk populations, we need to find ways to keep people safe at home as much as possible, which is exactly why this, this program is so important. And I also want to, to uh, again, echo my colleagues and say that an important part of this as well is that utility assistance and making sure that people that maybe previously were not as vulnerable um, now, as they may be facing economic hardship and have trouble turning on their air conditioners, we are really hoping that we can provide assistance to those individuals and also that the state, as part of their home energy assistance program, will think about um, modifying that in order to include utility assistance, as happens in other states, um, as part of that cooling assistance component of that program. Okay. Um and I know the city, so and what is being done around that? Because we, we know that HEAP is for heat in the winter. I know the city is doing, trying to petition the state um, for funding there. Can you, can you give us an update on, on what's going on with that? Janie, do you want to answer that? Sure, happy to. So um, the, the program is actually, it, it originates at the federal level. Um, it's run by the Department of Health and Human Services. It's a low income home energy assistance program. And it can actually be used both for heating and cooling. Um, the state uh, uh, uses most of its funding traditionally for heating. Only 2% of um, its annual funding goes to cooling. Um, however, this year the state received 28.8 million additional dollars in uh, uh, for the Home Energy Assistance Program through the CARES Act. And um, we, the city has uh, 
uh, requested that the state uh, put those fund, funds towards cooling assistance for the summer. Um, we've also asked for some program modifications to ensure that those funds reach the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, right now, uh, those funds are prohibited from being spent on anybody uh, receiving any kind of federal housing subsidy. Um, and it can, those funds can also only be used to purchase an air conditioner, not actually pay for energy bills. Um, so we've asked for waivers on both of those program restrictions. Um, finally, uh, there's medical documentation required um, uh, to receive that funding, and we would like to simplify that requirement um, to ensure that uh, we're not putting any additional stress on the healthcare system um, as uh, uh, families try to receive those benefits. Um, and so we've uh, requested these program modifications as well as a request to put uh, that funding towards cooling assistance for the summer. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'll send it back to uh, committee council, Bucky's. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brannon. Uh, Chair Levine, do you have any follow-up questions? No, actually, that's okay. We can we can move on to, uh, I think the public session is next, or if there's colleagues who have follow-ups, that's fine too. Chair Constantinidis? No, I'm good as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I'll call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will, will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Dr. Yuri Dvorkin from the NYU Tandem School of Engineering to testify. After Dr. Dvorkin, I'll be calling on Richard Berkeley of the Public Utility Law Project. Dr. Dvorkin, Dvorkin please begin your testimony after the sergeant starts the timer. Time starts now. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, good morning, Chairperson Braddon, Cohen, Constantinus, Levin, and all council members. Thank you for taking the time to address this important issue. And one of the privileges to testify at the end of this hearing is that a lot of great ideas have already been shared. So I'm going to deviate briefly from uh, the written testimonies that um, NYU submitted on my behalf to you. And I'm just gonna emphasize several points that uh, seems to be important and for whatever reason, we're not fully covered to the extent possible. So one of the most important thing is that Con Edison has operated a very complex engineering system and nobody can guarantee 100% uh, reliability despite their best efforts. And it's very important to ensure that in case of any outage, it doesn't matter what size of this outage, whether it's big or small, whether it's in Manhattan or in outer boroughs, Con Edison has an adequate capacity to mitigate it quickly and mitigate it efficiently. Among those concerns, the most important one is that even using the best index produced by this administration in collaboration with Columbia, we're talking about population groups, we're not talking about population individuals. And Con Edison should engage into a citywide outreach effort to really collect information on every customer on their network to realize what their needs are. It's not that difficult to organize, especially given the fact that they already have the entire billing infrastructure in place and they know what electricity needs of every consumer, how this electricity needs are distributed across the daytime and uh, how else, where this, uh, where this uh, consumers are located. And they can infer a lot of information about their average consumption, their peak consumption. They can track and monitor those changes. Uh, Con Edison, leading this outreach will make it possible for Con Edison also to learn about other needs. For example, whether this person is electricity dependent or vulnerable. This information will allow to deploy those generators, those portable generators that were mentioned in the first panel, to areas where the majority of vulnerable people are located. Another point that comes across this time is that actually, Con Edison has money to do it because as it was explained, 
there tariff includes three components, the supply component, the deliverable component, and the tax component. So Con Edison does not produce electricity on its own, but it purchases it from the wholesale market. And over the past several weeks, caused by the coronavirus outbreak, wholesale prices have actually reduced, in some cases, by 30%. So the supply component, which Con Edison pointed, one, pointed out as one of the biggest component of the resulting tariffs, right, provides them a lot of leeway to fund these programs. And in this case, they don't even have to tap into the capital part of the tariff that is being used to fund their maintenance great projects. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. I don't see that any council members have any questions for our first panelist, so I'll move on to Dr. Berkeley. Uh, sorry, to Mr. Berkeley. Time starts now. Thank you, and thank you members of the council and chairs. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss these important issues. Um, because of all the good questions um, that you put forward so far, I'm gonna skip most of my written testimony. However, I provided it uh, to central staff. So. PULP, uh, that is a public utility law project in New York, has a number of concerns about this summer. Uh, and I'd like to share them, but I wanna start by talking about the legislation that's in front of the committee. First, we applaud the move towards collecting data on heat vulnerability and heat deaths. We've advocated for 40 years to collect more granular data on consumers' needs from the electric, gas, telecommunications, and water systems in New York, because we believe, as the council does, that evidence-based policy is best. We also believe that in this first summer where Con Ed has agreed not to shut off electric customers during extreme heat events, it is important to collect granular data on how many lives were at risk and how many might be saved. We also note, by the way, that similar data should be collected for water customers and for heating customers in the winter. In a city that has adopted the use of objective and comprehensive data as thoroughly as New York City, it's appalling that we're only moving forward on this now. We also suggest that the council have its research arm examine closely the city's petition for additional discounts for low-income seniors energy bills in case 20M0231. Our petition, which is for immediate rate relief, utility spending reductions, which the council mentioned earlier, and greater consumer protections for what happens when the moratorium, which is only voluntary, ends at the end of the health crisis, but the economic crisis has not recovered yet. It's our concern and we've discussed it with the council staff, that there will be a tidal wave of disconnections at the same time as evictions and foreclosures restart in New York City and other parts of the state. And it's important to get ahead of that crisis right now, if possible. The type of comprehensive cooling and communications plan that is in front of the council and legislation is obvious. What is not so obvious is whether the city can deploy those vital needs in a timely way. Uh, nonetheless, we suggest that the New York City Office for the Aging and ACS be added to the list of agencies working on the report for the comprehensive cooling and communications plan so their vulnerable populations needs can be advocated for. We also ask that the council open a dialogue with the state's Office of Temporary Disability Assistance, that they just close their comment period on the plan for the 2020-21 HEAP plan, which could have included um, reduction of bills for people who need air conditioning. They normally do not go ahead and do that. We've asked them to, and we've supported the city of New York's petitions in these areas because we think it's a vitally important move forward, reforms that are necessary for this summer. Uh, obviously there's a lot more, but I hope you'll be able to read our written comments and thank you again for the opportunity to be in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Berkeley. I would now like to call on members of the WE Act panel. We will start with Mr. Sonal Jessel, followed by Tom Matt, followed by Anthony Carrion. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, can you hold, can you hold? Sorry, I got, Ms. Jessel, you can begin, thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, chairs and members of the committee. Thank you for your opportunity to testify regarding the summer heat plan. Uh, my name is Sonal. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at WE Act for Environmental Justice. <clears throat> We've been fighting for environmental racism since 1988. I myself am a public health expert who leads our work on heat and health. Um, I'm here to outline how heat and coronavirus is connected as a precursor to some of the other WE Act panelists. 
that will share important recommendations for the summer. Um, as many as have already noted, summers are getting hot, hotter, the heat is lasting longer. A 2016 Columbia University study projected that by 2080, up to 3,300 New Yorkers could die each year from intense heat made worse by climate change. Um, not, all city, not all neighborhoods in the city are equally vulnerable. Department of Health found that neighborhoods such as East and Central Harlem have high heat vulnerability index. Um, it also found that between 2000 to 2012, 50% of the heat-related deaths in New York City were Black or African-American people, even though, they're, even though they're only about a quarter of the city's population. Um, the summer is especially scary. Neighborhoods with high heat vulnerability overlap with high COVID rates, so those dealing with the most COVID cases also have the highest heat vulnerability. The heat will compound COVID-19 issues, and many of the inequalities in heat illness and death come from structural racism, where low-income people and people of color live in poorly maintained buildings, crowded apartments with intergenerational living, less green space access, live in neighborhoods with more air pollution, and stress their resilience and their means across many hardships, food, rent, chronic illness, and more. Uh, these are the same hardships that increase coronavirus susceptibility. Culturally, also I'll add that many communities of color turn to one another for support. On a hot day, if you don't have AC in your home, you might go to your aunt's house who does. Maybe you barbecue in the park together. So many minority communities consider family beyond the nuclear household, where we lean on one each other, each other as a primary means of support and for increasing resiliency. This summer, that's not something that households will be able to rely on one another for and are left without that important social, emotional, and material support line. The city needs to consider this as not only just a mental health um, impact, but the physical impacts of the losses of, of planning for heat. So it's imperative that Con Ed and the city create a heat plan that protects populations. I'll leave it to the rest of my WEAC panelists to outline that more. Thank you. Oh, I'll also add that um, we attached a number of maps to kind of outline the overlap between COVID-19 and um, uh, heat vulnerability, as well as AC use across the city that was submitted by Dr. Diana Hernandez's testimony as well. So I hope you all can look at those images for reference. Thank you. Thank you, Sonal. Will, will Tom Matt please begin his testimony, followed by Taylor Martin. Time starts uh, now. Yes, good afternoon, uh, council members. I'm very grateful for the chance to speak to you today. I'm an environmental epidemiologist and an independent consultant and also an adjunct faculty member at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Until 2016, I worked uh, at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and was capably replaced uh, by uh, Carolyn Olson, who you heard from earlier. Uh, the climate and health program at the health department has continued great work and provided uh, much of the data that's helped the city to get smarter and more uh, data-driven in its response to extreme heat. So a lot of the points that I was going to make about the importance of air conditioning have been well uh, covered uh, by the administration and in the Q&A. And I'm really pleased to hear that we don't, we don't have to um, discuss why air conditioning is so important. I'm just gonna try to amplify a few points. First is that uh, there's a huge challenge facing the city and I uh, commend the city on trying to set priorities and uh, reach the most vulnerable populations first, realizing that that population has really grown this summer. Um, second, the city's uh, plan to provide 74,000 air conditioners to low-income New Yorkers, 60 and older, uh, at one pillar of its COVID-19 heat wave plan is uh, really ambitious and uh, much needed. But these two other strategies of the plan need quick action at the state level. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program has, uh, as mentioned, only devoted a tiny fraction of its budget in New York State to cooling. And this has remained the case even while climate change has driven up the need for air conditioning use in New York City by roughly 30% over the last 10 years. Uh, advocating this change to LI HEAP has been part of the administration's sustainability plan since at least uh, 2015, but action by the state is needed now. Second, the Public Service Commission uh, appeal for the electric bill um, that I'm, I'm glad to hear many will be supporting. It needs to be quickly approved and whatever influence the state can use to uh, 
help move that along would be helpful. So these are two mechanisms that can be quickly scaled up and implemented. But as with many challenges facing our city, bringing these three pillars of the heat wave plan together will require close collaboration between the city and the state on outreach, enrollment, and assistance to navigate some different but uh, overlapping eligibility requirements. Our city needs to adapt in many other ways for hotter summers ahead. We need uh, streets to be greener, building retrofits and design changes. We need to stop wasteful overcooling in commercial spaces, which can happen very quickly. And of course, time's expired in the ele electric grid. So thank you very much for this chance to speak with you. Thank you, Tom. Next, we have Taylor Morden, followed by Anthony Carrion. Taylor, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, chairs and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify uh, regarding Con Ed and the city's summer heat plan. My name is Taylor Morton and I'm the environmental health and education manager at We Act for Environmental Justice. I lead much of our NYSHA work and I'm here to discuss emergency preparedness for the summer. Increased energy demand during extreme heat events can result in power outages. During the summer, temper indoor temperatures can surpass outdoor temperatures especially for households without air conditioning and during blackout and brownout periods. This increases the uh, risk, risk of heat illness and poses an additional challenge to individuals that rely on uh, electronic medical devices. Uh, we believe that it's important and vital that communities with people suffering from coronavirus do not experience shutoffs, brownouts, or any other form of acute electricity, acute energy insecurity. Con Ed and the city must plan ahead uh, there must be no excuse. One way to protect vulnerable populations is to waive the electricity costs for income qualified New Yorkers during heat emergencies. This summer, many more people are staying at home and many more will be unemployed. Affording electricity to cool homes will be difficult. Additionally, the city could preemptively set maximum temperatures for large office buildings, especially uh, considering if most or not all are under capacity. Last summer, Mayor de Blasio signed an executive order Number 97, directing owners and operators of large office buildings to set building thermostats to 78 degrees to conserve energy during the July heat wave. Lastly, special consideration must be taken into consideration uh, to those living in NYCHA buildings. More than half of the city's public housing residents live in its most heat vulnerable neighborhoods. More importantly, there are at least 62,000 NYCHA residents that are 65 uh, years of age and older the growest fasting age among NYCHA's tenants. 22,000 ACs is a great start, but it's not enough. Residents need help paying their monthly electric bills for their AC units, and the city must ensure that all elevators are properly working in NYCHA buildings. It is important that the city be planning for heat emergencies ahead of time, not to protect just our most vulnerable populations, but everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Taylor. Next we have Anthony Carrion, sorry if I mispronounced your names, followed by Liz McMillan. Anthony, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, Chair Brennan and other members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Anthony Carrion, and I'm uh, both a member of WEAC, but also a member of Manhattan Community Board uh, 9. Um, I'm also a lifelong Harlem resident. Um, and I've been involved in heat related issues for three years now. And my testimony is gonna be in regard to the cooling center program for this summer. Um, last year, I along with others and we I participated in an initiative to audit all the cooling centers throughout Northern Manhattan. And what we found was that many of them went underutilized or were unheard of, or um, some even had broken down cooling systems. Um, the cooling center report submitted outlines um, ways to uh, outline solutions in the long term, but also offers special considerations um, for this summer as we deal with the pandemic. I want to highlight two uh, issues in particular. One is communication. We feel communication is key. Um, cooling centers go underutilized because there's um, a lack of education and there's poor signage. So to this end, we feel the city must create a specialized uh, neighborhood-based communications plan uh, 
to tell the public a couple of things when the cooling centers are open, where they are located, and how they will remain safe during the pandemic. Uh, the plan must also include non-digital outreach to our most vulnerable New Yorkers as well. A uh, second topic I want to touch on is that now is the time to install and upgrade cooling systems in designated spaces throughout the city. Um, we understand that the proposed budget in April um, cut funding for the installation of ACs in public school uh, classrooms. Uh, we feel this undermines our preparedness for extreme heat now and in the future. And now is not only the perfect time to install uh, ACs in schools, but also in other areas, in other areas such as uh, senior centers, youth centers, et cetera. Um, in addition, um, this work would also provide much needed jobs, as you know, given the economic crisis that has been born of this pandemic. Um, lastly, I wanna say that extreme heat is a consequence of climate change. And as all consequences of climate change, it affects the most vulnerable populations the most. It is also a social justice issue. And therefore the city needs an equity focused plan for opening cooling centers and to address the issues uh, that I mentioned in my testimony. Uh, I wanna join with other advocates on the WEAC team in calling for a comprehensive and environmental justice focused uh, effort to address extreme heat this summer. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Anthony. I'd now like to call on Liz McMillan, followed by Sophia Longsworth. Liz McMillan, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding can you hear me? Uh, regarding the city's heat plan for the summer. My name is Liz McMillan and I'm a member of WEAC for Environmental Justice and part of WEAC's Committee on Heat, Health and Equity. I myself am a Central Harlem resident and I'm a graduate student of nonprofit at the New School. I'm here as an advocate concerned about the impact that extreme heat will have on my Northern Manhattan community in this time of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm speaking today on our concerns around the city's communication and public education plans for, for heat this summer. At WE Act, we have been working with community members to understand the full nexus of their concerns for, for summer heat. In these conversations, we have learned that there is an inadequate communications between our most vulnerable community members in the city. First, the communication about COVID-19 centers and other items are heavily digitized. Community where experience lack of access. I'm sorry to interrupt, Liz. I'm afraid that your connection is weak. Um, I'm not sure if you want to address that, and we can come back to you. Okay, I'm going to call on Sophia Longsworth to begin her testimony. Sophia, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time, and we'll go back to um, Liz McMillan after your testimony. Thank you. And time starting now. Good afternoon, Chair Brennan and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the city's heat plan for this summer. My name is Sophia Longsworth. I am a member of WE Act for Environmental Justice and part of WE Act's Committee on Heat, Health and Equity. I'm a Washington Heights resident who is acutely aware of the dangers of extreme heat on my vulnerable community members. I am here to advocate concerns surrounding extreme heat in this time of the coronavirus pandemic, specifically the city's external cooling plans for this summer, because it is important that this plan is equity focused. At WE Act, we have been working with community members to understand the full nexus of their concerns for summer heat. We have learned that people feel there is not enough access to green space and cool external spaces of town. Firstly, the mayor's plan to create oases during extreme heat events. 
Will these only be set up during what the city constitutes as a heat emergency? We must remain cognizant that many people are vulnerable to heat-related health illness, even during times that are not considered to be heat emergencies. Secondly, access to green spaces. Our most vulnerable communities already lack access to adequate green spaces and are increasingly concerned that the few areas they do have access to may be closed due to the pandemic restrictions. It is imperative that the city's plan includes keeping the parks open. Thirdly, shade. We know that shade in the form of tree covering provides an extremely effective form of cooling and its implementation does not require energy. Naturally, it is necessary that the city's plan includes increasing pedestrian shade covering primarily in vulnerable communities that bear the highest heat burden. And lastly, external cooling. Communities vulnerable to heat stress are also at high risk for coronavirus. And so it is vital that every precaution is taken to protect them from contracting the virus when designing external cooling, the parks, misting stations, and so forth. Therefore, I join other advocates in the WEACT team calling for a comprehensive and environmental justice focused effort to address extreme heat this summer. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sophia. Liz, it might be helpful for you to turn off your camera. Um, that might help strengthen your connection. And you may begin when you're ready. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, <coughs> I'm, your, your internet is not the best. So to continue, first the communications about heat, COVID-19, cooling centers and related items are heavily digital information, whether from TV, digital news outlets, or signage where they're made prompt to contact a website for additional information. So many WEAC members do not have access to the internet, computer, phone or they may be homebound, so do not see public signage. Essentially, the number of people that do not have digital access or are homebound is higher due to the pandemic. How is the city addressing these obstacles? It is vital that there be signage posted in buildings, particularly in buildings, with neighborhood specific information about heat safety, resources to protect themselves and about cooling centers. We recommend in the communications have a distinct icon that signals to New Yorkers that the topic is heat related. We also recommend the city not rely on notify New York, notify NYC text or phone numbers. Is there a plan for many residents that receive import a lack of trust of government by many different communities around New York City? How will the city work with other cities, such as trusted key community members and community-based organizations to share important pandemic issues, showing us how consistent and highly accessible communications is extremely important for people's health and well-being. Many people trust information if it comes from a familiar source. Third, we know that about 400 people go to the ER or hospitalized for heat-related illnesses every year in New York City. We are concerned that this year, people will not seek medical care for the fear of contracting coronavirus at the hospital or for fear of overloading the system. Without adequate understanding of heat safety, how to detect signs of heat stress and heat stroke in an understanding of COVID-19 safety. We're concerned that many people will avoid. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Liz. I'm afraid your connection is still weak. I would urge you to submit your written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And other panelists, please feel free to also submit your written testimony. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call on Cecil Corbin Mark, followed by Jalissa Gilmore. 
Cecil, you may begin when that sergeant calls time. I'm starting now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to just also thank uh, Chairman Brennan, Cohen, Constantinides, and Levine, as well as all the other distinguished members of the council who participated in the hearing today. And in particular, a special shout out to Council Member Barron, um, as well as Constantinides for their leadership around the Environmental Justice Act, Local Law uh, 64 of 2017. Uh, as my colleagues have covered a lot of territory, I just want to lift up uh, sort of some of the economic impacts that uh, COVID-19 is wreaking havoc with and then proceed to uh, a couple of uh, recommendations. Um, according to reports by leading economists, New York City's economy is more in a more precarious state than at any time since the 1970s fiscal and economic crisis. The current situation has been described as likely to be worse than the economic devastation wrought by 9-11, the 2008 to 2009 Great Recession, or Superstorm Sandy. The social distancing public health orders at present has incapacitated a substantial portion of the city's economy. Weekly, the news catalogs job losses and new unemployment claims that have mounted since the beginning of the pandemic and are unprecedented. There is currently an estimated more than 1.2 million New Yorkers, or somewhere over 27% of all private sector workers, uh, reported to be jobless as of the end of April. And in an environment where businesses have been ordered to close and non-essential personnel told to stay at home, the economic situation, when layered on the extreme heat crisis due to the climate change, then layered on the social disparities and the structural racism problems that have been revealed, create a profound set of displacement uh, and economic loss for uh, communities like Northern Manhattan and other environmental justice communities across the city. I think that the pandemic, as many of us know, is not something that we can expect to be ended in the short run. And we are hearing from public health officials that indeed uh, we will be experiencing a possible second wave of the COVID-19 crisis. In light of these particular effects, one of the things that we are uh, looking for at this particular moment is we want to definitely applaud the uh, pre-considered uh, bill for uh, 6197 calling for the collection of heat data on vulnerable populations in New York City. That data should be shared with the Environmental Justice Advisory Board that is pursuant to Local Law 64 of 2017, uh, the environmental justice law. Um, we want to also make sure that the city is considering expanding uh, the people that could be considered for the air conditioners inside of NYCHA, as Chairman Levine also pointed out, um, to include uh, low-income families that may not include seniors. We know that there are many families Thank you for your time and look forward to submitting our testimony moving forward. Thank you, Cecil. I'd now like to call on Julissa Gilmore to testify, followed by Carlos Castel Krupp. Julissa, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starting now. Thank you, chairs and members of the city council. I'm Julissa Gilmore and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. NIJA is a citywide network of grassroots organizations from low-income communities and communities of color in environmentally overburdened neighborhoods, including those on the front line of climate change and its impacts such as extreme heat, which results in more deaths than any other weather-related event. NIJA commends Mayor de Blasio and his team on the COVID-19 heat wave plan to keep vulnerable New Yorkers cool and safe at home. However, there's still more that the city can do to protect vulnerable New Yorkers. The administration has recently taken important steps towards preparedness with the city's cooling center program, but cooling center locations still need to be publicized prior to an extreme heat event. We commend speaker Corey Johnson for acknowledging the need for building specific cooling centers for vulnerable populations in his state of the city. Um, all cooling centers should ensure extended and overnight hours to address high nighttime temperatures due to the urban heat island effect. It's likely that New York City is underestimating the number of annual heat-related mortality 
it is absolutely necessary to ensure estimates are as close to accurate as possible so that the scope of this issue is not underestimated and the appropriate amount of resources can be directed towards reducing heat-related morbidity and mortality. Nija appreciates Speaker Johnson's call for legislation requiring DOH and MH to reevaluate its metrics for counting heat-related deaths, as Nija has long championed. We also recommend that this legislation call for data transparency by making daily level heat mortality data available. Heat waves put increasing strain on our energy grid and causes the most polluting peak of power plants to be fired up, worsening air quality and increasing electricity costs. As Con Ed considers how they prepare for extreme heat, they need to specify a clear plan for how to protect New York City's most vulnerable communities from extreme heat in the event of brown and blackouts in the future and this summer. There was a missed opportunity for local green jobs hiring throughout central Brooklyn when Con Ed pursued the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program. This time around, both Con Ed and New York City must ensure that clean renewable distributed energy investments commit to a just transition framework where green local jobs are stimulated and maximized for frontline communities. NIJA supports the city council bills to address extreme heat, but we look forward to ensuring that these bills address all of NIJA's longstanding priorities related to extreme heat. As the climate continues to warm, we will see increased social consequences of more frequent and severe extreme heat events. New York City needs to ensure that we are protecting the most vulnerable by properly preparing for heat. Time's expired. Thank you. Thank you, Jalissa. I see we have a question from Chair Levine. Chair Levine. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I did want to follow up with we act on one or two points. Uh, you raised so many good ones. Um, so now uh, the uh, low income home assistance, home energy assistance program uh, is probably more important now than ever. Are you pushing an agenda for ways that can be improved? And I'm going to ask one question to Cecil too, and then I'll, I'll let you all respond. Um, I know you've looked at a lot of other cities beyond New York, for examples, uh, good and bad on, on kind of social justice issues related to heat and other factors we're discussing today. Uh, I think Paris and Barcelona are often cited, but if you have any lessons, good or bad, we can learn from those or other cities, I would be interested in hearing. Um, but if so now you wanna start us off, that'd be great. If we, oh, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Councilmember Levine, for asking that question. Um, broadly, we act as working on what we're calling the Heat Health and Equity Initiative, and it's it's going to be a multi-year campaign around how to address the issue of extreme heat for Northern Manhattan, but New York City overall, even New York State. Um, and that's like a multi-year plan. And before COVID-19 hit, we were, you know, thinking a lot about how to put in kind of like more systematic fixes and how LIHEAP as a funding source can be used to put in those systematic fixes by way of more energy efficient systems for lower income folks. Um, now with COVID-19, we're also looking kind of a little bit more towards the short term and, and we've really, um, you know, been staunch advocates and, and kind of trying to push forward this, this aspect of how to cover people's cooling bills, not just giving people ACs. Um, right now, HEAP only covers about like one to 2% of um, their funding is goes to cooling and like 98% of it goes to heating in the summertime, I mean, in the wintertime. So we know that um, the program isn't really adjusting A for climate change and B for like what is really the reality this summer. Um, so yeah, we're really pushing in the short term, how can we find like pull heat funding that we're getting extra from the federal government. There's also um, another bill in, in the federal government looking for, I think like $1.5 billion for heat. If that goes through, that would be a lot of more funding source for this um, and how we can kind of coordinate with our utility companies to, to provide that the monetary assistance for paying the energy bills. Because, you know, we have members that have said, I have a $300 energy bill in the summertime. There's no way I'm turning on my AC. 
Um, so, you know, we know it's a big problem and, and are really actively working on that in the short term, but also planning for the long term. Ultimately, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, achieve a more energy efficient, you know, New York City. So we're also kind of doing this long term campaign towards how do we kind of reimagine that home energy assistance program to cover that for low income folks as well. We're part of the petition for the to the PSC about um, utility bills. And uh, uh, thank you, Chair Levine, for the question. So just in response to other models from around the world, I would encourage the city to look at Paris, in particular for the app that they developed to share with the residents of the city of Paris the cooling infrastructure that they have around the city. Um, clearly, there is a digital divide in our communities, but still many people in our communities do have smartphones. And so we want to be able to take advantage of the opportunity to make sure that the data that's being collected, both on heat vulnerability, but also on cooling infrastructure, is shared as widely as possible with the city. Um, we, too, have also called on uh, the city at different times to really look at the issue of creating signage and possibly to launch a program in collaboration with residents of the city about the most effective signage and wayfinding towards cooling centers. Um, Barcelona, on the other hand, uh, has really, I think, effectively used the issue of uh, implementing more green infrastructure to lower the sort of urban heat island effect of the city. And so that's another example from the international realm that uh, can be gotten. The C40 Collaborative, which New York City is a part of, has documented a lot of these findings. And so the folks in the city can definitely look to those examples through the C40 Collective. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say on the issue of uh, really creating an opportunity for a state budgetary funding to advance um, uh, the payment for cooling centers, I think that's because, not cooling centers, sorry, but uh, air conditioning so that people's bills can be paid, as Sonal was referencing, that clearly has become so critical uh, in the wake of some of the economic devastation that we're seeing. I mean, we're looking at economic forecasts that now may take three and four years for the economy to recover. Small businesses shutting down really means that many of the people in our communities are not going to be able to have, you know, the income to be able to pay for electrical bills, which is why we act, yes, as Sonal pointed out, join the petition. But we also need both folks in the city and the state to take a longer term view of this in terms of not just the immediate response, but what are going to be the programs in place for the two, three, and four, possibly five years out as we go through an economic recovery, um, as many economists are telling us. So just a word of caution that this is not something that is short term in nature. Very helpful. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you, Sonal. And thanks to Wei. Thank you, Chair Levine. We'll now call on our final panelist, Carlos Castell Crook. After Carlos, if there, are, if there are any witnesses who have not had a chance to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you after Carlos's testimony. Carlos, you may begin after the Sergeant calls time. Time starting now. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Crook and I'm a representative from the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy more healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chairs Brandon, Cohen, Levine, and Constantinides for the opportunity to count, testify before the council today. We all know that it was, as we continue to pollute and overconsume, our climate intensifies. This has already resulted in noticeable climate changes, including unusually frigid winters, scorching summers and unpredictable natural disasters. As we approach the summer months, we worry about the imminent heat waves that we have experienced so often in recent years. Last year held the hottest July on record for the planet. And as the years go by, summer temperatures are expected to increase ex exponentially. Heat waves take an even greater toll on New Yorkers as the urban heat island effect intensifies warm weather. Moreover, these heat waves disproportionately affect New York City's environmental justice communities. Higher rates of illness, including COVID-19, and limited access to air conditioning puts these communities at a higher level of risk during extreme weather. 
In addition, cooling areas such as local pools and beaches, beaches um, are expected to remain closed this summer, leaving many residents, especially seniors, with the nowhere to escape the heat. For these reasons, we are asking that the city formulate a thorough plan to assure, ensure that residents of environmental justice communities will be provided with safe ways to stay cool in the summer months. We commend the city for its recent announcements to pur purchase 74,000 air conditioners for low-income seniors. This will surely provide massive relief to many residents. Still, we look forward to mo a more comprehensive plan that reaches all environmental justice community members. We hope that Con Ed will serve as a partner in this effort by helping to protect our most vulnerable neighborhoods. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Carlos. As there are no raised hands, I will now turn it back to Chair Cohen to give closing remarks. All right. Uh, I really just want to say uh, uh, thank you to everybody who participated uh, patiently. Uh, uh, I really want to thank the staff again. I thought uh, today could not have gone more smoothly. Uh, so uh, I think that the you know that we are uh, cautiously optimistic based on the testimony of Con Ed and uh, and, and the administration. But uh, I want everyone to know that the uh, the council is going to be vigilant in monitoring uh, the availability and access uh, to cooling uh, through this summer. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I don't know if any of my other colleagues uh, want to say anything before we close. Chair Levine, Chair Brennan. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, yeah, I echo your, your, your comments. Um, uh, it's always nice at a time like this to be cautiously optimistic. I think we have no choice to be, but, but to be cautiously optimistic based on what we were told today. Um, you know, I think trust but verify is a phrase we heard a couple of times today, and that's our job in the city council. Um, to, to make sure that, that this stuff goes right. And I think part of the reason why we had the hearing today was because we wanna, we wanna address this now, right? We don't wanna have an oversight hearing in October to talk about what a disaster it was. And we don't want our heads to be exploding in June as this whole thing in July or August when this whole thing unravels, we wanna get ahead of it now. Uh, it does seem like the administration uh, uh, agrees with that and, and, and they seem to trust what Con Ed is saying. So, We'll take their word for it and we'll just have to stay vigilant on it. Um, we are very concerned that the same communities uh, who were greatly impacted and devastated by COVID are the same ones that are in the crosshairs of a long, brutal, hot summer in New York City, especially in the outer boroughs. And as we've seen, um, you know, the dynamics of, of the summer as far as power outages, when you have a lot of our districts um, far outside midtown Manhattan that have overhead power lines. Our power goes out every summer on a normal summer when everyone is on vacation. So everyone being home, running their air conditioners, trying to stay inside and social distancing is a real, real concern. I don't, Con Ed and, and, and City Hall, I wouldn't say that they, they don't share our concern, but they don't seem to be, they seem to think that they're prepared. So we're going to have to stay on top of them. So I think I think we got a lot on the record today, and we're just going to have to stay vigilant. And I thank the staff for doing such, like Chair Cohen said, really doing an amazing job behind the scenes um, and running this basically effortlessly, which I'm sure it's not effortlessly behind the scenes, but it felt, <laughs> it felt that way to us as chairs. So thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you. I I think Chair Levine had a. Very, very briefly, Mr. Chair, and I also want to thank the staff. This was pretty much a flawless five-hour hearing, except for one or two times where I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself, but that's on me. Um, on a serious note, you know, the activists who spoke, the experts who spoke, and I think just about all the council members who also asked questions and spoke, you know, we, we've been talking about equity issues around heat uh, for a long time long before this pandemic. But coronavirus has now raised the stakes immeasurably. And this is um, really uh, has the potential to result in wider, wider spread of this horrible virus in profoundly inequitable ways if we don't address the cooling needs of low-income New Yorkers in this city before it gets hot. The stakes really are incredibly high. So to everyone who spoke today, who's working on these issues, 
we need you more than ever. And you certainly have the support of all of us here in the council in that, in that effort. Thanks again to everyone. Um, and thanks to my great co-chairs, um, Chairs Brannon and Cohen and Constantinides. Back, back to you, Chair Cohen. Okay. And uh, with that, I'm going to gavel it.